Yay! Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dr. Ben Show, the show where you can call in and talk to real Dr. Bens and tell them that Dr. Ben shouldn't have human rights. This week, you can talk to Dr. Ben and also me, who is not Dr. Ben, but who also wants to remove Dr. Ben rights. Dr. Ben, we haven't seen you in months, and we have discussed your demise at length. How are you? Well, I've been here. I just haven't been on with you. I was on with Arden like the past last week. Something like that. Oh, and then, well, like, that doesn't count because Arden that. doesn't count. So. <laughs> so welcome to the Katie show where Katie just plots to ban the rest of us. And basically, we're only on this show so that Katie, you know, can pretend that she lets other people in on this. But really, it's just it's just the Katie show. So <laughs> it is because, you know, I'm the only trans person <laughs> worth hearing from. So <laughs> she's not even going to deny it. <laughs> yeah, all the rest are just fakes and poses and trans trenders. So, you know, mm. yeah, yeah. See any Heard rational conclusion that you can come to if you uh, ignore all of the data, which is the theme of this week. If you would like to be a science denier or, denier or to ignore the data, then why do you not apply for a leading position in the UK government? Because you're almost guaranteed to get the job. And you could also call in and tell us about all the things you're going to deny. Um, <laughs> it will be fun. <laughs> But yeah, this is a call-in show, and you can call in on the number below, uh, or you can click in the link in the description and call in for free on the internet, if you have the internet, which is something most people seem to have. Um, you can also, if you would like, send us a super chat of $5 or more, and then we will read them out at the end of the show, which is always a fun time if you send fun super chats. Or a bleak time if you send bleak super chats. So let's have some fun ones and maybe a couple of bleak ones to, you know, keep the contrast good. Um, but yeah, uh, before we get into it, Ben, uh, what has your week been like? I've been on leave. Um, so I've been at home, which is why I'm here at this time, because I'm not working right now. Um, and so it's fun because, you know, I had all these fun things that I was going to do. Well, okay, I, I did put together some furniture because now I, I actually have furniture in my house. Surprising. I know I went a long time without that. Um, but I was like, you know, I could do all these like super fun things. And then instead, my ADHD brain was like, let's actually like binge listen to like a whole semester's worth of lectures on medieval history and this is where we're at now i'm almost done with my break and i've i'm now basically a semester of medieval history smarter um <laughs> which is great but i didn't i didn't uh -huh. need to i didn't need to go on the rabbit hole of how syphilis got to england but this is something that i did investigate a lot while <laughs> I was on break. Who was so it? Now, who was the person who brought it, it over? Well, I don't know who it was, but like there's the whole, like the the whole thing where, where for a while they thought that it came over from the Americas via Columbus and they're like, the historians were like, oh no, this is absolutely it. Like, cause we found it like in the Americas, like before 1492 and then it went to Europe, but they found a lot more evidence of it in, in France and in England in the late 1300s, suggesting that they already had it there. Um, and so, like, it was just kind of a racist thing saying it came from the Americas, but actually right. for a while it was called French disease. And so, because it came from that sounds so more like French it. <laughs> it probably comes from France. I wouldn't imagine. I would be surprised if all diseases came from France. <laughs> calling something French disease is just like calling it like wet water or something. I think we need to narrow it down a bit more. But yeah, definitely <laughs> but, but the yeah, most likely. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, definitely that's what I thought. Um, how have okay, you been, Katie? Sounds good. Um, yeah, this week's been pretty garbage in terms of politics, but the weekend was really good because I went to, drumroll, the European Pokemon Championships, uh, where I took oh. part in the card game championships, and I came in the top 512 players in <laughs> Europe, which I'm quite pleased with. I was 495th, I think. Um, and I was so close to getting through to the top 10%, um, which would have been like really cool uh, of, of people who got through. So um, yeah, it was, it was a good time. And uh, 
I, I used Chen Pao if anyone likes Pokemon and likes that Pokemon. It's a little ice cat with daggers for teeth. And he does a little dance like. <laughs> so it sounds like something you would do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so that was good. Um, yeah, obviously this week has been a little bit garbage, and I don't think our poll question is on it, but that's entirely my fault because I've been a bit of a zombie today. But we do have some good poll questions. We can first look at the poll question from last week when Dr. Ben definitely wasn't here because he's a liar and he hasn't been here in months. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... I will read it out because I don't know what it is, and then we can we can hear what we think. Did you engage in blasphemous celebrations this past Sunday? Oh, so it's a very exciting Easter question. What was your yeah, blasphemous no, celebration? I mean, well, but here's the thing. It's asking about your celebrations this past Sunday, so I know that this was written for us to talk about Easter, but now in today's context, this is talking about this past Sunday, which is not Easter, but did you do anything... <laughs> This past Sunday, that was blasphemous. I, I do blasphemous stuff all the day, like all, all the time. I I don't ever think of God. I mean, I guess that's kind of blasphemous. Um, you know, I what, what does God not like? I an unmodest woman. That, that's pretty blasphemous. Um, so yeah, I think so. I I played with demons. Pokemon are demons, aren't they? Yeah. Like, uh, so we, they need to be banned from yeah. society to keep the children pure or something. And I'm willing to bet that we were both trans this past Sunday. So that's pretty disgusting, to be honest. Yeah, I said bad. Well, I said, I'm not going to say that they're bad things, but I said negative things about two of the saints on Twitter this past week, because I'm disgusted that um, they are Spanish inquisitors that are still regarded as saints in the Catholic Church. Um, so I said some things about that, but yeah, so but most saints are garbage people, aren't they? Like, you oh yeah, look most them of them are garbage. Yeah, yeah. You look them up, and it's like, oh yeah, they were knighted because they like cut the hands off fifteen natives or something, or like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's gross. It's gross. It's like it's like Mother Teresa. There's some like some expression where people are like, oh, I'm not Mother Teresa, like as if that's you know you're not good enough to be her, and then she ran like some science denial poorhouse for children where she just let them die of diseases because she didn't believe in medicine it's like yeah. oh and this is your saintly figure is it okay cool good stuff <laughs> yeah i um, legitimately ran across like a catholic blog over the weekend that was like yeah this person actually is okay and they should still be a saint because they didn't directly cause the execution of people in Spain during the Inquisition. It's like, okay, yeah, they didn't perform the execution, but they kind of, and they, and they didn't technically sign the order, that was the state, but they tortured them and did all the other things that allowed for that to happen. So it's like, but it, you can't trace it back to the person. Yes, you can. You absolutely can. What was, so. And some of them are mad as well. Like they have to, I think the requirement from the Pope is they have to have, uh, done two like you in order to be a saint, you have to perform two miracles after you've died or something. Is that right? Or like two in your know. life? I don't know, but this one they like call him a martyr because he was assassinated by Jews in Spain <laughs> because they were being murdered. And they're like, Oh, he was a martyr because he was assassinated. Like, no, he was assassinated because he was like calling for the, the mass slaughter of non Catholics. <laughs> 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 fucking horrific it's just so, <laughs> yeah. so bleak I'm trying to find this one I, sh I swear I might have made this up but I swear that the last Pope to be canonised uh, did so because he cured someone of a cold after he died I, I, mm. I swear that's a thing. Yeah. Maybe maybe someone can uh, call in or write in. But mate, don't call in this is a trans call in show no. <laughs> super chat us that because I, I, I swear that's the thing um yes yeah so blasphemy is good so next question let's see what we're asking this week uh for you to talk about which will be trans rights related i'm sure ben go for it yeah um does oversimplifying definitions to cater to cisgender understanding negatively impact trans rights discourse yes or no and this is my soapbox for this week because like i have I have issues with people who, and oftentimes they're very well-intentioned people, 
but they know just enough to be dangerous. And then there are a lot of colloquialisms and like simplifications that we use to describe things that sound okay, like if the other person understands where you're going with it. However, there are times that we oversimplify something and people don't understand the underlying topic. And then that gets perpetuated as misinformation. Um, and so this is where I'm coming from with this. Um, and specifically, I got in a Facebook argument with somebody who was trying to come from a, a pro-trans perspective um, in saying that, like, and the way they got to this was was terrible. I, I think like you and I will both be like, no, that this is not the reasoning we, we do with this. But like trying to say that there's utility in saying that like biological sex can be boiled down to genetics because, I mean, if you really think about it, almost everything out, apart from like epigenetics and like uh, exogenous factors like do stem somewhere from genetics. Um, and, and that's true. However, if you say that, you know, all of it can be boiled down to genetics and then you use that to discuss with people, that's how you get the, the myth that, you know, sex is immutable and trans people are that sex and they can't do anything about it. And now they can't play in sports. So it's like, it, it makes sense. Like if you understand the nuance you're correct in that you can arrive at the, it all boils down to genetics. However, that is not useful in talking with cis people who don't understand. It's not useful in talking with anybody who doesn't understand the nuance because now they're just going to use it in ways that it wasn't meant to be used. And, and this particular person's argument was going into um, that like sex as a concept, like even under that definition of it being genetic, um, is only useful for people who are geneticists or like medical professionals who are using it for like that reason. And like, yeah, okay, I can g arrive at that same conclusion with you. I also agree that like biological sex really it has no utility other than like your own health, and that's it. Um, but like the how how this person got to that was by saying that sex boils down to genetics, and that's where the problem is. So I think. Yeah, I think it's something that like we all need to be very cautious about and I think that simplifications are necessary. Like people don't understand all of the same things to the same level and you can't constantly argue the the nitty-gritty nuance with everybody, but we have to be very careful about if I say this this way, what is the other person interpreting by this oversimplification and is this going to be spun in a way that is unintentional? And and sometimes you can't prevent that from happening, but we can try to make sure we're we're giving like conductive like arguments instead of just like oh I don't know just saying things that are not as helpful. Yeah, I like, I totally agree with that. I think that like one of the like the skills in communicating things publicly or discussing with people or even just trying to change someone's mind one on one is being able to understand what your audience understands from what you're saying uh because i mean if you were to just like like an example of this in action is if you just rattle off all of the science in the full proper terms as if you're talking to an expert to some random on the street They'll have no idea what you're saying and it will just be meaningless. But you might be able to communicate the same information to them if you just chose your words differently and used a load of analogies and and stuff. So when you're when you're simplifying things, we're saying sex just boils down to genetics. You've got to realize that maybe if you're talking between, like Ben says, between two experts, that's fine to some degree, if you've already got the premise there and stuff. But most people are gonna read that and see you understand that you're saying sex just is chromosomes like it the whole of sex is just whether you're x y or not um and that's false so you need to like especially in the context of trans rights where a lot of people are trying to claim that so you need to like when you you could you could easily say well sex just boils down to genetics because every factor of humans 
boils down to genetics in some way in that it's either caused by your genes or caused by the environment affecting what your genes would do in a world without the environment. Uh, therefore, if we ignore the environment, genes are the only things. Like, yeah, you could make that argument, but if you, at least if you said that, we would see where you're coming from rather than if someone just walked up to me and said, sex is just genetics, I'd be like, uh, what about hormones? And they'd be like, well, genetics cause hormones. And I'd be like, what about if you take them? They'd be like, well, maybe you're genetically predisposed to want to take them. It's like, okay, I see. <laughs> right. So your initial point was kind of badly communicated and stupid. Um, but maybe you're still arguing from the right place. So, uh, yeah, totally agree. I think just so when I read this question, the first thing that came to my mind was like when someone's saying, what even is a trans person? And sometimes people are really keen to have this like all encompassing definition. And sometimes that ends up with you saying a load of academic discourse, or sometimes it ends up with people saying anyone who identifies as someone different from their original was signed to say like, and I just think those kind of things are kind of crappy. Like maybe if you want to write in a academic journal or something, they're good. But uh, if, if you're talking to someone who's asking this question, either they genuinely don't know and you saying a load of words at them is going to be meaningless, like a load of buzzwords and stuff. And w all they really want to hear is like someone who was born a boy and is now a woman. Like that's, that's what they need. And that's like really yeah. oversimplifying it because that's not the full scope of things. And there's loads of room to, you know, discuss about what those words even mean. And we can, you know, someone could easily do a, multiple PhDs in this, but that's not the point. We're trying to teach it to someone who doesn't know. Or they are a liar and they are just trying to get a dunk, an easy dunk off on you when you say something that's not technically true because you'll say something like, um, but a trans person is anyone who identifies as a trans person or something. And they'll be like, so I identify as a trans person then. And then, you're like, then they're like, well, not actually you because, and then it's suddenly you go off on some spiral and it's all a big distraction and they don't really care what the answer is anyway. So it's important to just consider your audience and remember that most people know absolutely nothing. Whatever you're talking about, most people know nothing about it. Um, yep. So, yeah, that's, that's my answer. So I think yes and no is the answer. So try and click on both mm. of them. <laughs> but that's anyway, just the case with a lot of our polls. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the fun of asking yes, no questions about something that people want to, maybe you could write a comment and that would be good for the algorithm because just before we go into calls, uh, we are sad to announce that YouTube doesn't really like this show and it keeps demonetizing us. And uh, unfortunately, this show does require at least some monies to run. Uh, so we are just politely asking if you would like, and if you'd like this show or other shows on this channel, because there's loads of cool ones on this channel, maybe you could have a look at our Patreon if you like. Um, you can donate to that if that's the kind of thing you'd like to do. And one of the new things that's coming for Patreon subscribers only is um, we're going to have a Patreon exclusive podcast. Details for that still to come, but if that's something that you think you might like the sound of, then go and check it out. Um, I'm sure you can easily find that from probably the description in this video. Uh, anyway, you would like, uh, you can probably just Google it as well. But anyway, let's get into some calls. So Ben, do you have a favorite from the calls listed or shall we just go from the top? We, uh, we can go from the top, although one that's coming in looks very interesting. It looks, it looks spicy, yeah. but let's go. Okay, we'll yeah. go from the top. So we're gonna talk to uh, Jaina, um, in possibly Oregon, is that OR? Um, who is Oregon, talking about yeah. non <laughs> talking about non-binary transition? Jaina, go for it. I think this is probably a question for Ben, so I'll uh, I'll let you two go off. <laughs> uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be for Dr. Ben. Um, so I'm calling on behalf of a friend with their permission. Uh, they're mm -hmm. AMAB, agender, and um, wants to look into um, medical transition horm hormonally, um, the big issue that they're having is they have a lot of dysphoria around the effects of testosterone on their body and specifically libido. So um, I think they have like some kind of like post-orgasm like depression or something going on. 
So they aren't necessarily ready um, at this time, maybe in the future they might, but um, to maybe do a full, uh, like what would be considered a, a typical trans woman um, medical transition, but they do want to reduce the effects of testosterone. But of course, what are, you know, I guess like I'm asking like what would be the concerns for that and also what language could they maybe use with a provider to um, advocate for this? Um, yeah, I guess like a clarifying question and you may or may not know, like is the concern mm -hmm. um, with they want to keep a higher libido while undergoing transition or are they wanting to reduce it? They would love to eliminate it if possible, but re reduction oh. would be the, you know, the next step. Mm -hmm. That's easy. <laughs> that's easy because <laughs> well no because 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 the the thing is that's a, a common risk with a lot of gender transition and it's not like a lot of people mm -hmm. still have a, a sufficient libido like after their transition but there is there is a risk that it could decrease um or not really be present um because we we kind of have association of, of testosterone um increasing libido for a lot of people although i i do know subjective reports of trans women who have had positive like increases in the, in their libido because of estrogen but that's like more individually based and i don't have the the data to necessarily say mm -hmm. like what that the kind of difference is but it, it's a common risk like for anybody undergoing um like gender affirming hormone therapy is that your libido could significantly decrease um and oftentimes when we're counseling people and like, hey, is this something that you want to do? That's something that comes up. And so sometimes when people want to keep a higher libido, that would be a reason to not be as aggressive with their gender transition because it is a risk. So the fact that this person is wanting that to be an effect is actually like kind of assuring that maybe they do want to go forward with this um, sooner. And, right. and that's something that can, they can bring up with their healthcare team and say, hey, yeah, this is not a deal breaker for me. In fact, this is a positive. This is something that I'm, I would be looking forward to. And then that can help guide their decision making of what medications would be best for them. Because I mean, maybe in somebody like that, like I know there's for different people, there's use of androgen blockers. And so that might be a reason for this person to do more of something like that in addition, um, whereas somebody else might not want to do that. And so it'll just kind of guide the different combination that you'd be given and in, in kind mm -hmm. of the dosages. So I think like, and this is just for anybody, if you have th thoughts of wanting to start transition, having kind of um, like a list together, even saying like, hey, yeah, this is, th these are the things that I've read about in, in looking into the different methods of transition. And here are the things that I am like, looking forward to happening or like more interested in happening. And here are the things that I'm like le less interested in. Um, and then here's like kind of the deal breakers of like, I don't want to risk this, like having your own ideas on, on paper is nice, or even just where you can discuss it with your team. And, and then they can help you talk through what are the doable options. Um, and I think it just allow for, for some good open communication um, between people. Katie, I don't know if yeah, you have um, thank thoughts. You. Oh, Katie, you're muted, I think. I said, sorry, go on, Jaina. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, like, um, so that, that's, yeah, kind of what I've been telling um, this person is like, yeah, you're probably going to lose libido, which is what you want. Um, I think, so uh, context is like, they're uh, extremely shy and like, want very, you know, specific language as possible to uh, advocate for, yeah. for themselves. Um, I think like the big, because um, androgen blockers, I think is definitely what they're considering, but I think the like bone density, like issues, things like that, if they're not maybe like substituting, like would they have to substitute any estrogen or is there a world where they could take some degree of androgen blocker and not have to take estrogen? Well, so this is something that I don't know if it's as commonly being used for um, transition right at this point, but I know it's been talked about and i brought this up on the show too is um serms or selective androgen receptor blockers which are fantastic they're used mm -hmm. um for treating osteoporosis in people who have like breast cancer risk so it allows for like 
estrogen to work in some places and not to work in others. So it works well on bone. It works well on fat distribution, but it doesn't increase like breast growth or anything like that. So it's kind of nice for a more um, androgynous transition. This would be specifically for people mm. um, who are are undergoing a feminizing transition. So this wouldn't really be an option for people in a masculinizing transition, but for somebody that like wants um, a more androgynous transition, um, that is something on the table. And that's something depending on who this person goes to, maybe um, that person would be comfortable prescribing something like this. Um, namely, if if they have access to an endocrinologist, that would be somebody that um, like would probably feel more comfortable doing that, even if it's a like not as okay. um, common at this point in time. But that's something coming down the pipeline. Um, but they're also, yeah, I, I think if this person has a, a good conversation with um, like their physician, they can they can figure out the the right combination for their particular needs. I guess awesome. something I like could... that. So, sorry, just I guess something I'll add just from my experience and not as a doctor, and obviously only my personal experience, and it might be different from everyone else's, but. Um, I would be very careful changing hormones and stuff sp like specifically with the goal of like reducing sex drive or something just because if you have hormone levels that doesn't really work for your brain whatever that is it can make you feel fucking garbage like the worst yeah. I've ever felt in my entire life has been when my hormone levels were changing from like the previous one which didn't feel great to the new like my current which is fine and it's like i thought i you know some things before were bad and some things were fine and then i went through this like zone which didn't last that long and it was particularly when i was on one particular blocker or decapeptil but it was just like unbelievably bleak <laughs> um so mm. it's just worth bearing in mind that maybe you can change hormone levels and it might have the desired effect of you know, feminizing or not, or reducing your sex drive or not, but it also like might melt your brain, and it might not because lots of other people seem to find that the time when they're changing hormones is fine, or um, you know, they they don't really feel unbalanced, whatever their levels are. So, like, some of my friends have, for whatever reason, been without hormones for a lengthy period of time, and they've kind of felt fine in that time. And I know that even if I miss my dose by like you know, a few days, I start getting anxious and uh, depressed. Mm. So it, it is worth bearing in mind that you can't always predict exactly what's going to happen um, right. in, in those regards. But then, on a probably, I shouldn't make this joke because it's probably not funny, but I'm not in the best mood, so I'm going to say it anyway. If you do, if you want to lower your libido, the best thing to do is just get depressed as fuck. <laughs> it's always worked for me in the past. Um, but yeah, true. no, don't, don't do that. I'll, reckon, I'll recommend <laughs> Sorry, Jane, that. <laughs> I think you were um, going to uh, say something else. Oh, yeah. I, uh, thanks, Katie, for that. That's a also important point, I think, for them to consider. Yeah, it's like that there could be other side effects. Um, and then I, yeah. I just wanted to double check, Dr. Ben, you said CIRMS, like S-E-R-M-S. -E is that the, the word? Yeah, that you yeah. It's an it's an acronym. So selective estrogen mm. receptor modulators. Um, okay. But CIRM is easier to say usually. So yeah, that's something to bring up. And yeah, I, I think Katie's points are absolutely accurate. And so it's it's going to be a more in-depth discussion between this person and their provider. And mm -hmm. like, there's going to be some compromises like on, on either way. Like there's going to be some things that you are going to risk in order to get the benefit of, of certain things. So kind of having that priority list is is kind of helpful and saying like, this is an absolute deal breaker for me. Um, whereas mm -hmm. this thing is like, okay, yeah, it'd be nice if I had this, but not the end of the world if it doesn't. Like, um, for example, when I'm talking to like trans men about um, like contraception, there's kind of a, a give and take of like, if you want, like if you're not on testosterone, um, like, do you want your menses to stop or do you want to not have any female hormones? And that's like mm. a balance like trans guys have to go through of like, are you willing to put up with some progesterone at minimum in order to stop your bleeding? Or is it worth it for you to keep bleeding and not have those? So like there's gonna be some things where you just you can't control the exact outcome. Um 
But if you if you go in thinking like, hey, this is the thing that I absolutely care about, and it's okay if these other things are compromised because of that, like that's that's going to be up to this person. Um, but I think having those priorities set are it is at least helpful to know like if I have to choose, like this is the thing that I really want to be affected most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank thank you so much. And I was kind of hoping that for like other people in the audience, like the AFAB people, like to hear. Yeah. I was hoping that maybe they get to hear a little bit information too. So thanks for adding that. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to have uh, them listen to this call, and hopefully this will encourage them to to do some research and uh, talk to a provider. Awesome. Thanks for calling in. All right, thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Jenna. Right. Okay. So um, yeah, sorry for my probably rubbish off. Uh, what's no, the word? you're good because the next one, Joke. the next one, you're gonna talk a lot more for. I think. <laughs> no, no, I was just gonna say I just probably made a, oh, yeah. a joke which didn't really land. Um, oh, gotcha. But <laughs> shout out to whoever's uh, watching this back and uh, expecting to get some good advice and just just gets this dumb joke and said, uh, obviously you got good advice from Ben. So now we are going to talk to uh, Summer, um, who always saying they are trans and also seems to be describing trans women as biological men. So, Summer, go for it. What's your argument Hi, here? Hi, David. Hi, Dr. Ben. Hi. Hello. So I'm hoping that we could have a, um, a civil discussion about this. Um, I'm very well educated in this, um, in this part of social issues. Um, and, and so I'm really hoping that we can, um, you know, talk because I've, 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 I've gone through my transition, um, had all the surgeries, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, I've spent a lot of time researching these topics and I'm, I'm sick of seeing biological men walk into, um, walk into you know, women's spaces like locker rooms, like um, in Alaska, where the man walked in and he's shaving his beard. Um, and Hang then, on a second, you know, kind of just so we're clear, do you consider yourself to be a biological man? No. So what's the difference? When, when did you stop being one? Um, I stopped being one when I got my surgeries. So the day, so like the day of the surgery, you were a biological man in the morning, and in the afternoon you were a biological woman. Or, well, after all the hormones that I've taken, um, and the surgeries, and the FFS, and you know all those surgeries, yes. So I'm I, I'm just wondering if you feel like it was a binary flip from one to the other, or if you think it was a sliding scale. No, when I was four years old, like I realized, and you know, I pass. And when I first started transitioning, I pass. Um, you know, I'm five six, one hundred and thirty pounds. Um, and sure, but, uh, you know, but what and I, I mean is, so obviously, you. I mean, I don't know what age you transitioned, but obviously, at some point, you consider like trans women. For example, me. At some point before I came out you would have said that I was a biological man. And it seems like you'd be saying now in my life that I am not. So I'm just wondering if in your opinion, that there's a certain moment in time where that flips from being one thing to another, or whether there's some kind of gray area sliding scale. Yeah, I would say that just over time, as I became more aware of, um, protecting women um, and what what trans people are doing to the LGBTQ community and what they're doing to women's spaces and how they're making them feel very uncomfortable when you've got women that own Giggle. Uh, well, and that hang on, hang on. Some, okay. I, I feel like you've dodged my question. I'm just obviously okay. in your transition, when you were transitioning, there was a point at which you, because you consider you know, trans women who haven't yet done surgery or whatever, you consider them biological men. There must have been a point at which you either considered yourself a biological man or a biological boy, whatever that means. And there is a point now in time where you don't consider yourself that. Um, 
I am interested what you do consider yourself now. And I'm just wondering, wh when does that change? Like, does that change on the day of right, your surgery? Okay. Yes. Five right, years I to understand. Yeah, so right. it changed after my surgeries, um, after having all of my surgeries and going off and going through and then um, understanding all of the issues and what's going on in the world where, um, a, so yeah, so does that answer your question so we can move on? Well, so, well, I, I do think this is kind of like the, the core point and also probably where I'll start answering the question I think you're going to ask. It, sure. So if you say it's after your surgeries, I mean, I don't know how many surgeries you've had, but does that mean, I don't know, also don't know what order you had them in, but say, for example, it'd be possible for there to be someone who is transitioning into a woman and they plan to have gender reassignment, genital reassignment surgery and then facial feminization surgery. They're still a biological man after the first one or what, at uh, which, yeah, which point? So yeah, I mean, this isn't really what I was calling in to talk about because the, re the reason I, I why I'm bringing this up, what trying to do. Yeah, yeah, the reason no, I'm bringing this up is obviously I want to know which point in your transition you started using women's spaces and what it is that you think other people need to do and trying to, I need yeah. to understand first where you think these lines are. Sure. sure. Yeah, so I think that there needs to come a point in a trans person's life where they need to decide um, when they when they start passing. I didn't start using women's spaces until I passed, until I knew that I passed. I had to go so through. Your, so my question. Sorry. Yeah. So my question is then, like, is it when you pass or is it when you have the surgery? Because those are two yeah. completely different points in time. And I think that's where Katie is going with this. Both. Like, Both. When both? you pass and have the surgeries. So when you have... Okay, that's so let me ask you a question. Years. Because I, I, I feel like it's very easy to, to address this from like the, the rhetorical statement of people assuming that trans women have like these huge beards and like these lumberjack figures and then they transition and, and suddenly it's okay for them to be in spaces. Let's flip this because... Um, if I, so I've not had bottom surgery, I've had top surgery. Um, and I, I would say I passed most of the time. Which bathroom should I use? Which spaces should I use? Right. So, okay. So let's look at, um, no, answer my question. I, I think what spaces should I use? Yeah. You should use the bathroom for men, right? Okay. But does, so surgery is not by your definition. So surgery is not part of it because I haven't had bottom surgery. So right, I'm a biological is, man. Right, but cell plasty is but, completely different. So then different why is the definition different? Well, why, why is that different? Why, why is one side not a biological change, but this one is? Like, why, why is because your metric biological different biological women trans people? can pass much easier than biological men. So you're saying that the whole definition is just passing. So passing is your metric. Why, that is what you are saying. Why are you? But, so do you? Con, you do consider yourself a biological man who passes as a woman? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it's not what you said earlier. So there's no point in time well, no. so in what transition. I'm is, yeah. So what I'm saying is, I went through all the processes. I went through all the surgeries. I got my birth certificate changed. I can now go into a women's locker room and shower with other women and other women do not know I was biologically male. What, what order? Except that I, to just, except I could just, also just, go into, I could go into a women's bathroom and shower and nobody would know I was biologically male because I wasn't by anybody's definition. So then why can't I we use the women's bathroom and the women's shower? Wait, I don't understand your question. You just said that you will. Wait a minute. You said you didn't have bottom surgery, I, right, Doctor Ben? I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. But but you okay. said that I have so to use the pass? men's bathroom and the how men's facilities. Right. How could you pass? Yeah, but a, you're saying a, I shouldn't use the women's bathroom. one. You were saying that I shouldn't use the women's one and that I should use the men's one because I pass as a man. No. But I don't pass there. But I pass in the women's bathroom with if i wasn't wearing any clothes so like why can't i be in the women's bathroom 
you could go into the women's bathroom, I guess. If so you, I'm very I mean, confused if you about want to what your argument problems, is. It's so inconsistent. If you want to cause issues, then yeah, you could do that. I'm saying I want women to feel comfortable in those female-only spaces. And a man going into a women's locker room that has a penis does not make anyone feel safe. If I was in there, if I was in a women's locker room and a man came into that space, I would not feel safe. I would leave. So what if, so what if I walked in the space? Okay. So let me give you a very weird hypothetical here. So like okay. I make people, I would make people very uncomfortable by walking into a, a women's space, right? If I was looking the way that I am now, let's say just for some reason I walk in there, people are uncomfortable. I'm like, no, no, it's okay. And I just like strip and everybody knows what, that I that don't have a penis. Is <laughs> now okay, because I wasn't bringing a penis into the women's space. Right, but why do you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? I'm. It's a hypothetical to point out that your argument is so inconsistent. Like, why would, I'm very why would anyone want to do is. your suggestion? Why would anyone <laughs> want to, like, I don't understand. People constantly, constantly talking about these hypothetical trans women who want to get their genitals out in front of a open plan changing room full of a bunch of cis women. Like, who the fuck is doing that? I've never, yeah, literally never met Canada. trans woman who wants to do that. There's a 50 year old man swimming with little girls in Canada. In a, um, in one of do you know this facilities. person? You know, you know that person was summer. Do you yeah. know that person was trans? Was that a trans person or was that just a man yeah. being a perv? No, it was a trans person. It was a, it was a How man you know? identifying as a woman. How do you know? Because it was all over the news. Oh, and wait, the news well. is 100% <laughs> accurate all the time. The news is always correct. Yeah. So, so I mean, the, the obvious. Katie, why go, are you defending yeah. these people? The obvious, That's what I want um, to know. I think the obvious solution to this is just to not have open plan changing rooms because I I wouldn't want. I mean, if you're saying it's with kids, I I don't want an adult woman who I don't know coming in and flashing in front of my kids either. Like, why are people waving their genitals around in the change room? That's already a problem, regardless of whether they're trans or cis. Uh, I and and also equally, you don't want some man coming in and waving their genitals around in front of your son, like who's a child. I, I just think. Open plan change rooms are just totally garbage. And I think I think it's like a it's very easy to say, oh, there was this one example in this one really hyper specific situation. So therefore we need to ban all trans women from all I, I'm not really interested in that because I still want to understand, because to me, your position, as I understand it, doesn't quite seem to make sense. And that's why I want to ask these questions. Like, what was your timeline? What was your order? So it sounds like you've had, you know, you've been on HRT and stuff, and you've done some surgeries, and at some point you started passing, and at some point you started using women's spaces. Like, what what order did that happen in those those steps? Because you were saying when when you pass is the most important. So presumably you started passing, and then you started using the women's toilets at work and stuff. Um, <clears throat> and was that before or after surgery? And which surgeries? Yeah. So after my after I started passing and I was able to then and had all my surgeries, that's when I started using women's spaces. So you passed, you pa so you started transitioning, you started passing, then you started having surgeries. And then once you recovered from all the surgeries, you started using right. the women's toilets at work. So there was multiple years where you passed as a woman but went into men's spaces. Oh, yeah, so I started. I started. How many HRT years? In, yeah, I started HRT in August of twenty-two, and I had my surgery, um, and I had my surgeries uh, a year, about uh, a year later. Both of them. Well, how many? How many? Which surgeries did you have? FFS, top surgery and bottom surgery. All all at once, or? Uh, well, pretty much back to back. It was a couple of months in between each one. Pretty brutal. Um, I, yeah, I don't know who, if I believe that because that's. Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm serious. Like you were... so I have Kaiser permanent, and um, and the, when W pass changed from twelve months to six months after getting after being on surgery, I already had seen my therapist. Um, already had the letters. Um, already got approved from W pass. Um, and then got the surgeries and scheduled them. And so you just went back to back, like 
barely any recovery time in between is what it sounds like. That sound, I mean, that sounds brutal. And I mean, if you, if you did that that way, I mean, like that's I fine, but it just that. Yeah. I, so I, I've, I've before talked to trans people who can, or trans women who consider themselves biological men who say other trans women shouldn't be able to use women's spaces and who themselves use women's spaces. That, that, that is an archetype of, of trans women. Uh, there's very few of them, but you do meet them. And usually when you ask them about when they can start using women's spaces and all this stuff, for other people, they have this, you have to pass, you have to have had all the surgeries. And then when you ask them about their own life and what order they did things in, suddenly it becomes all a bit hazy and it's not quite clear because like I know from my life, the reality is as soon as you start passing, even as a trans woman, before you start just passing as blending in as women in society, you start getting sexual harassment and horrible comments. And as you start stop uh, being read as a trans woman, start being read just as a woman in general in society. Um, I can't imagine anyone being read, like it, whatever your situation is, I just cannot imagine people being read as a woman during their transition and being like, ah, oh, well, I have yet to have breast augmentation. Therefore, I will not use the women's toilets at work. But like, I can imagine a situation where it's someone who doesn't have a job and they don't go outside. You know, perhaps that is the case for some people. Um, but I, I want you to like, just, just be clear to me. Was there a time in your life where you were passing as a woman and you were going out and about in society and you hadn't yet had genital surgery and you were just walking into the men's toilets, like in the pub, at work, in the shopping center. Like, is, is that actually what you did or is that just what you're telling other people to do? No, no, no. <laughs> so when I started passing and I had my, after I had my like top surgery and things, yeah, then I was using bathrooms only, but I wasn't going into locker rooms. I wasn't going on to um, other you know places like that that were that would expose myself. Um, you don't and, have and to I expose mean, yourself I, in a I'm, locker room. Like I'm I mean, they're, like Katie was saying, right. like yeah, it's like <laughs> most locker rooms have like a restroom inside. Or like shower stalls or something like there are options for you to change in private if you want to be in there and not expose yourself like there are options and just because some people choose not to use that doesn't mean that there aren't options there like right. you don't have to yeah. expose well, like yourself said, like, to change call, in, in the I locker room call in to talk about this. i called in well no but yeah. so uh, why so why does it a position though isn't it like yeah if you believe that there should be like gatekeeping Obviously, that when people say gatekeeping, they mean some kind of regulations or some kind of rules. Right. But you're yeah. making your own decision. Like if we said, oh, OK, in order to use women's spaces, you've got to have had genital surgery, then that will mean that there are a bunch of trans women like you who are banned from using the women's toilets like you did. Or they'll end up drawing a line somewhere else where they'll say, oh, yeah, if you've had genital surgery and face surgery, you can use women's spaces. And there will be some trans women who do those things and still don't pass. Um, and then you'll be saying, oh, well, the gatekeeping still isn't good enough. And it will just kind of come down to like your opinion. Uh, like, you know, what, 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 how could you possibly gatekeep this? I mean, you were saying you must pass in someone's opinion in order to use it or is it just down to the person to make up their own mind because the reality is whenever it comes to anything like this there's only actually three ways we can possibly do this you know if we want to have some kind of system for who can use the women's toilets at work either it's up to the person to know best like what you did and like what i did we decided both you and i summer when was the most sensible time for us to use women's toilets at work or right. We have some kind of government regulation with checks and certificates and stuff, and then check the certificates, and you're going to have to just like tick a box, yes, I've done whatever, or we just leave it down to the society to just police, and then someone decides you look like a man, they'll just, you know, kick off. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is that you can't have a certificate for passing. So it ends up having to be based on surgery or hormones. And it sounds to me like you started hormones and then had surgery and started passing really qu way quicker than I did. 
Um, Correct. So if we had some kind of time limit on it and we said, oh, you have to be on hormones for 12 months, you wouldn't have even meet, meeted that criteria when you're using women's spaces. And if it's some kind of surgery yeah. requirement, then you wouldn't have met that requirement either. Like what is the requi right. what possible well, requirement what possible requirement is, is that if you have if you are if you are not passing, you should not be able to use those women's spaces. I mean, when you I'll are when, like that guy in game like the, <laughs> that, that person in GameStop, um, you know, and they're screaming and yelling and, and they're and they're 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 pushing around their misogyny. You know, that's just it's it's yeah. not the right way to handle Summer, things. Summer. It's not right. Summer, do you think do you think locker rooms should be policed heavily like do you think somebody should be there making sure the right people go in and the wrong people don't well it seems like that 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 yeah you can't do that right now but when you have you people trans people you, that are walking you, into these spaces like that no, so what you, what you do, do you it's Summer, not a real what problem you, what do you propose what do you propose to wait to you make this happen to be able to go into those spaces how do you enforce so how do you enforce that how is that enforceable you can't enforce it so right. then why so, are we talking about this? Like, <laughs> so then why are I mean, we talking about this it sounds like you've got a hypothetical it sounds like you have some internalized transphobia here like no question about it um but now you're you're complaining about an issue that you have no way of enforcing reasonably and they're saying we can't. No, I'm saying and so I'm confused about why we're even out. why we're even talking about this. Other than why like, it seems like the only yourself? reason to bring this up. Then, no, it sounds like the only reason we're talking about this then is that you've got some problem with with trans people using these spaces, um, and and you're I wanting do. to, yeah. But you have nothing that you can do about it. So why are you coming to an online platform to argue about something that you have because, no way of doing anything right. about? So what I'm hoping that, well, because I want people to understand that when you are not passing and you're walking into these female spaces and you're making them uncomfortable, um, that you need to take pause and say, hey, you know what, if I do this, this is going to cause problems. So why can't they just stop causing those problems? Because it makes the whole, it, look, it makes all trans people look bad. Well, I mean, so what you're really saying, so like, like the purpose of your call in really is to say it's you should make your own decisions and don't be dumb about it and maybe you disagree right. with some people when they've made their own decisions but it doesn't actually sound like you're calling for actual gatekeeping you're saying you sh it's up to you when you start using women's spaces and just be sensible about it would you say that sums up your position that's a lot better yes yes and so yeah, if the language if you're using was very gonna, inflammatory <laughs> yeah if people are gonna like obviously people are gonna have different opinions of when that is and different opinions of who passes and who doesn't um like you agree with that right oh yeah for sure but for but, but for the the most part you have to have at least a consensus of whether or not that person can pass right no you don't well, no, well, you don't. You don't because because a pro there comes a problem then with if there's a consensus for who passes. Like, does this extend to cis people that don't look like what you expect a cis woman to look like? Where, where does this go? You are enforcing a stereotypical beauty standard that even a lot of cis people can't meet, and so that's one of also my... a problem. Like, are you are you suggesting that in order to keep women feeling safe, that anybody that doesn't meet that standard? not use those facilities so are we talking about women who are cis women n also not using those facilities because they make people uncomfortable where does this go yeah one of my one of my friends uh, I, has been confronted i mean i've never been confronted going into the women's toilets or even had a weird comment or anything uh because of when i started using women's spaces one of my cis women friends who's a bit older than me has been confronted her entire life over this um you know, and people saying, oh, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong toilets, mate, get out, you know, this kind of stuff. And um, so, I mean, t I don't know how we can possibly measure a consensus, because if we go on Twitter, I think we could easily get a consensus that says, I look like the most stereotypical man of all time, because there are thousands of people who tell me that all the time, even though they're obviously delusional. But it seems that at least in some places, there's a con consensus that my cis women friend doesn't pass and I do.
And then right, the yeah. discomfort here is, I mean, like if someone comes in, but, and I think it's important to sort of compartmentalize this stuff. If I'm in a room and someone comes in and starts waving their genitals around, I'm going to be uncomfortable. It doesn't matter what genitals they are, or whether they're trans or cis. If someone comes in to a room I'm in, like the toilets and I'm washing my hand and I'm like, oh, maybe this person's a trans woman. Maybe this person is a cis woman who has not been blessed in the stereotypical femininity department. Um, the, I'd, you know, if I feel uncomfortable at that, that is different. That's a different thing. Um, you know, if you clock someone as trans and you're then uncomfortable because of that, that isn't the same as being uncomfortable with someone waving their genitals. Because often people come up with this once happened in Canada story, you know, oh, well, we do have a single example of someone getting naked in a women's changing room and looking just like a cis man. Okay, cool. But now we're kind of trying to extrapolate that and suggest that because you don't pass as a cis woman, you shouldn't be allowed to go to the toilet in a service station. Like these no, are totally different types of discomfort. I know, but right, I well, I mean, that's how it's come across. <laughs> because there are some people I who are never going to pass as a cis woman, but they will obviously pass as a trans woman. Like thing. everyone here's who the thing, looks at Katie. them is going to go, that is a trans woman. And when they look at them, Katie. you're not going to know what genitals they have. And if you see someone come into the toilet and do a wee, and wash your hands and go, and they're attract, and you're like, I think that's a trans woman, and it makes you uncomfortable that they did that. I mean, so what do we do? Ban them from going to the toilet because you feel a bit uncomfortable Katie, that I you've decided they look like a trans woman? No, Katie, I didn't call them to say that. I'm saying that they're look. I took the steps to pass, and let's just compare this to cancer. I'm sure let's so do my family. My family passed. There are, my family there are a lot of people. Feet. Summer, okay, there are a lot of people what? who there are a lot of people who who take the steps to pass just like you did, or maybe they took those steps at a later age in life where they've had more poor. development so. to yeah. Or so like so you're saying that because you had the situation happen, that you are in a position where you're comfortable and that you pass and all that. Like that's great. I'm happy that you're able to pass. What does it say? Fuck you to the rest of trans people because you were able to do no, a thing. No, I'm not saying that. It's, it, I, I, I don't know if you that. understand how how problematic this all sounds, and that's I'm why we're opposing yeah, this. Yeah, I kind of come across that as that summer, like whether that's your intention, because I mean, right. there was a time. I'm not saying that because I obviously yeah, I'm not saying you know that. I'm saying you know from your transition no. that there was a time when you didn't pass as a cis man and you didn't pass as a cis woman, and every single person you walked past who looked at you was like, that's a trans woman. And when you're in that kind of zone, in a, maybe we can come up with some hypothetical idealist world where there are loads of different types of toilets or something. Oh, it's just nonsense. But in reality, you've got to pick one or the other. And when people are reading you as a woman, but also reading you as trans, and you're saying, well, you know, kind of just deal with that. And, and then maybe that for you, that was a really short time. Like for me, that was, uh, I don't know, in the order of a year. Um, and for some people, that is their entire life. And like, you know, you can say, I took the steps to transition. To I actually life. had enough money to afford FFS. So uh, it's just like, you know, these people are going to be thinking, well, fuck you. If I could get FFS, then I would do. Or maybe they're thinking, I don't want it because I think I look nice enough. And the, there are some people who, also just happen to have really garbage opinions on trans rights in general who are uncomfortable because what well, i don't fit their standard of what a real woman should look like I, like this is different to this bloke in canada or whatever that you've come up with this is it's just, just the normal though, every trans woman who you know the, the vast majority of people who are just trying to get on and live their life and they're just they're making their decision they are faced with I can either use the men's or I can use the women's. They know they don't pass as a cis man. They don't. They know they don't pass as a cis woman, and they have to make this decision every day. And they come to their own conclusions. And maybe. And then if you're saying, "I don't think you pass enough," you should basically get fucked. Um, you can see why no, people might that's be upset. No, that's not what about. I'm saying. That is not what I'm saying. You are twisting my words. 
I'm not trying to. This is just how I'm in interpreting yeah. what you're saying. Like, if you, you know, you're if you're not passing, where do you go? Quite possibly. But, it, you know, if you don't pass, even if you've taken the steps to do so, regardless of whether you have, what, what do you do? Yeah. I get that there's a time between where you're not passing and you're passing. And those times you should. Some then people, that's use, forever. You know. No, it doesn't have to. Look. Look, it does if have you to have cancer, if you have cancer and you're trying to save your life and you need money to be able to do that, then you're going to do anything that it, it, it takes to be able to save your life. That's, right? a really bad, that's a really bad analogy. And also <laughs> yeah. there are plenty of people who cannot afford that. There are plenty of people that, and you know what happens, you know what happens, I Summer, do you know that. what happens to those people who are in a period where they're trying to do everything they possibly can to not have cancer anymore? You know what happens to like the majority of those people? They die without health care. Like that's what happens to them. Yeah. And that's, that. that's actually a great, yeah, that's actually a fantastic that. analogy. No, that's a fantastic analogy to what we're talking about because there are also a lot of trans women who are doing everything that they possibly can within their means to transition. And then many of them die without health care. So like that's, I think that analogy is comparable in that way, but are you really on the side of, yeah, they should do everything they possibly can and then still, you know, <laughs> get fucked. Like, it, this is this is where we're going with it. Like, I like you're- say it to, I yeah, never yeah. What said for anyone to get fucked. I never but said that's you are being so you, you generous with me. But you said, well, th you, what you were saying essentially led to that conclusion. So we're confused. Like you're saying that no, these things no, that we're saying are consistent with your mouth. argument. I'd rather talk these okay. are the conclusions so that this gets to. Would be so, like come with me. Oh, you want to talk to me, Summer? I'll jump in. I'm going to be nice to our hosts, but you don't want to talk to me. I promise you that because I can see the call notes. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we do have. I was, I was going to, you know, ask about. It does say when you last called in and what you were calling about and various other details. Uh, it's just interesting. Well, maybe we'll bring that up later, but I guess I want to, um, I want to ask, obviously this is an anonymous call to a degree other than what I just said. How much did your FFS cost? My what insurance part? covered it. Well, that's lucky, isn't it? Um, cause it's not, not everyone lucky. has. Insurance. It's not lucky. Yeah. It, it didn't, it didn't cover mine. I had to pay for mine. And I was just looking up, like, there's a bunch of people who live in countries where the yearly salary average is less than the cost of a surgery. Um, I, I'm, I, I mean, I think it is very lucky that your insurance covered FFS because no one in the UK gets that. Uh, and we have, like, free healthcare. And I can't imagine that most Americans have that insurance like that. And, there are and insurance certainly plans out there, and I sought Asia. those insurance plans before I transitioned. <clears throat> uh huh. But you have to pay in a bunch of money for those plans, right? And you have to live um, in a state where they $200 exist. Two hundred dollars a month. Yeah, you, two hundred dollars said... a month. Yeah, right. So, so all you're really doing is you're projecting your own experience and just saying everyone else should be able to do it. But like, if you live in no. a country like Thailand, right, where there are definitely a bunch of trans people and they're quite well least accepted in society compared to the surrounding countries. They don't have medical insurance that covers FFS and their yearly wage is literally like a quarter of the cost of the average FFS. Uh, average. Right, but... So what are they going to do? Stay for 60 in. years? I know, this but uh, the I point is in. that you, you called in with this kind of like, I did something some... A certain way. Why can't no, everyone else be like say, me? I didn't say anything about me. I am saying. But you're saying you're saying people should go out, to the people should go out of their way to try and pass. And I'm saying, yeah, the lots of people simply do not have I think the money or the time available. Pass. Yeah, well, not not everyone who wants to do that can do that. Even if we ignore the people who don't want to do too that. Too bad. Too bad that you don't then don't transition. Yeah, well. So Fucks, isn't it? That's that's what we're yeah. saying. That's the other option. It's like, oh, well, you're trying your best to pass, but you're too poor. <laughs> too bad. No, I didn't say you're too poor. You? <laughs> then figure out a way to do that's it. That's what you're saying. Put some effort how do these people? How do, people, how do these people, how do these people figure out a way to do it when they're too poor? Tell me, how do these people figure out a way to do it when they're too yeah, poor? They tell me exactly it? what. Yeah, tell me exactly how how they should do it. I hope it's get to get a second job. Oh, this is 
see, this is not why I called in. This is a very nuanced conversation. You're, I'm yeah, and, and you don't. Sorry for the nuance. The nuance. <laughs> Sorry that this doesn't that you don't understand the nuance of your position. But tell me exactly. You're making the statement that they should do everything possible to get these well, surgeries, not, yeah. and if they can't do it, this is your position that they should do it. So, what is your proposal that they do? This is not why I called in. I called. I don't in care. This is what we're talking about. You, made, that summer. you can't. You keep oh. saying that as a way to get get out and avoid answering the question. But you made the claim. You made the statement. Tell me how they should do it if you're going to stick with that argument. Or do you how want to change your position? Pass? No. How how, they how should they afford to pass? How should they let's, let's achieve? Just the, yeah. yeah. But let's pick the average UK citizen who doesn't have access to insurance, which will cover FFS, so and who transitions. Why don't they have access to insurance? In... Why can't they get access? Why can't they figure out a way to get access? We, we don't have. You that haven't in the done UK. any. We have the you, NHS. Haven't, you haven't done any research on. You haven't done any research on this at all. The wait lists alone in yes, the UK are astronomical. Oh, yes, I have. No, you're so wrong. So what? How well, do we, we do it in the UK then? How do we do? Yeah, tell us. How do we do it? How do you get private insurance, which covers FFS in the UK? I didn't call about FFS. I've literally never met someone in the UK who has private health insurance, and the NHS does not cover FFS. Summer, it you doesn't... keep saying that you've okay. done the you've done the research on this and that you understand no. how this works, and then you say, and then and then when we ask you something that you don't know the answer to, you just say, "I didn't call in about that." Like, so yeah. it sounds like you don't actually know I and you're just dodging questions by saying you didn't call in about, about that. Do you know what we're talking about? Do you know what we're talking about or do you not? Do you know what it takes to get private health insurance in the UK or do you not? Or, or another country not like UK, Bangladesh. No. But I, that's not what I'm calling about. That's not what I'm even talking about. But it's the I'm core part of your, of your argument. People want to someone. transition should try to pass as much as possible. Yeah, and if they can't pass, then what? If they can't pass, then then what? What do you mean? So, like, if someone, well, like, uh, if, if, if you're wearing a beard and you're women are never gonna a pass. women's room, yeah. I'm talking about then, how biological men with beards are walking in. But you're a biological women. man, according to you, so I don't know why you're saying biological men. What we're, What we're talking about is trans women, and we're not talking about this extreme, ridiculous case from Canada. We're talking about the average trans woman on there the street in the UK cases. where we don't have $200 magical health insurance. The average trans woman on the UK who transitions at 25 years old when she does her best to pass and really wants to pass, uh, what, what happens now? She doesn't pass as a cis woman, but is obviously a trans woman. Yeah, and so she shouldn't be showering with women in a shower yeah, no, room so with what, other women. What then. should she do? Where go should she go? Shower. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's so your answer is to get anyway, fucked. isn't it? We yeah. don't. We so, don't. So really your have answer is to get plan. fucked. I think the shower thing's a total like deflection, though, because we. D I mean, we don't have many open plan changing rooms and showers here. Uh, you know, the, my local places that are in a sensible range will have just have cubicles. I'm talking about real stuff that you do every day, like using the toilet. Like when when I go to the toilet at the pub, uh, maybe I go to the pub more than most people, <laughs> but going to the toilet at the pub was a, used to be a stress point for me when I was early on in transition. Like it's a new pub. I don't know what the clientele are like here. You know, maybe it attracts more transphobic people or whatever. And it's like, well, how much do I think I pass? I don't really know what I need to do. Like that's a stressful situation, right? And it's good knowing yeah. that when I have made the decision that I think, I know I don't pass as a cis woman, I know that anyone who talks to me is going to be like, oh, that's a trans woman. That I can still safely go use the toilet. You know, that's, without... See, that's not what I'm talking right? about. I'm, so, I'm not talking about people that, 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 that kind of pass. I'm talking about people that absolutely do not pass, that do not give us, that don't you know, care that they have a beard. Yeah, so then what care. happens to you, the you people in the middle? Don't pass. You, you said people who don't pass, and really what you meant is people who haven't, people who haven't transitioned in any way, shape, or form. 
So that's a different argument. To the world. That's why we've been yeah. like, it's a, it's a completely different position to argue. <laughs> right. right? And that's one of the reasons why I called in to talk about those issues, not these nuanced past or past not issues. I'm not talking about okay, bathroom right. issues. I'm talking about trans Somewhere. people going into spaces that don't, that don't even hardly try to pass. Summer. Okay, right. Let's. We've had a good forty-minute discussion here. Uh, so, how about now we know that you want to argue instead, not about people who don't pass, and not people about people who can't afford FFS, but actually about people who there allegedly exists a class of trans women who doesn't transition but does socially transition or whatever. Yeah, totally Let's talk about them next time you call totally in. Totally changed how I wanted to talk about this. You totally railroaded me. You totally changed everything about why I called, why I was trying to call it in the first place. Well, I think that it's as a skeptical show, as you'll know, because you've called in before. Um, we need to uh, get to the root of things, and when people say stuff, sometimes there are premises that we need to analyze. And if, like you I said, at one point in the conversation, you said you're not a biological man. And at another point, you said you are. At one point in the conversation, you said people who don't pass shouldn't be using women's spaces. And now at another point, you've said that's not quite what you meant. So you can see why we had to at least approach these things, because it wasn't clear. Obviously, what you were initially trying to communicate did not come across in your first few statements. Correct. So Correct. Yeah. I'm saying next time, call back. Changes. Call okay. back, and I think next time we will talk about. Uh, I would, I would really like to, and it doesn't sound like you would like to. I'd really like to understand why you consider yourself a biological man. Um, but we can also discuss p p trans people who do not medically transition but do socially transition. So we'll talk about that next time. Thanks for the call, Sam. Okay, when I see you online again, I will call in and we'll talk about that. Wicked next week. Okay. Bye. <laughs> um, right, that was a good call, everyone. Yeah. I, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> um Spice. It, I'm not I'm not gonna make any hard accusations, but we get a little like we don't get that much information. It, it it is anonymous if you call in, but we get like the notes you gave last time, including your name and your pronouns and the date you called in and what you were calling in about, like underneath your current call and uh for most people they line up so that's all i'll say um but let's let's move on i'm, I'm curious yeah i'm curious if this person <laughs> ends up calling uh when arden's on just to hear arden's response and i i can tell you arden's not any when nicer than as mine. two of us <laughs> <laughs> yeah. arden might be more spicy for you <laughs> oh she would yeah, have survived I'd... me talking <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see a, an Arden and a Matt tag team, perhaps, um, on on a similar. Oh, call. oh, that'd be great. <laughs> um, right, okay. I haven't had a quick. Let me just give me one second to read these. Um, wants a steel man position. Wants to talk about gender criticals. Um, and while we're while we're doing that, um, more uh, announcements just for things. I know we already talked some more about the the Patreon and things. Um, but there's going to be some new shows right. and cool stuff coming, coming through the Patreon. So it'd be a really cool time to see you over there. Like we're going to be, um, releasing some new, like Patreon specific shows that will have some more participation from, from people that are part of the Patreon. So if you want more of us doing possibly some ridiculous things, um, that might be a, a great option for you. So there's definitely going to be some incentives to doing that. Um, and also, I don't know if we talked about this yet, but there's um, for a lot of the shows on the line, there are multiple episodes now through the week. Like the Sunday show has been having two episodes um, on the Sundays. Um, and so there's talk about some other shows having multiple episodes too. So um, be on the lookout for those things um, and trying to figure out like, what times work well for everybody. So if you have particular thoughts about certain timings or certain shows that you want to see more of during the week, those are things that you can comment and say, hey, I want to see more Takis uh, throughout the week. And you can say that. You can you can tell the channel. You can. Um, and they can consider it. <laughs> you can demand a Sunday show on a different day, but also it's still to be called the Sunday show. Let's do it. Let's try and have seven Sunday shows a week. 
<laughs> right. Everything's just um, the yeah. Sunday show. <laughs> Every day is Sunday. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> wake up, turn the calendar over. It's Sunday again. That'd be good, actually. <laughs> Unless you work yeah. Sundays, and that would be pretty garbage. Um, anyway. Anyway, for, for the people still alive and still awake after the last call, Let's. I would quite like to talk to eleven six. Are you ready for eleven six, Ben? Yes. Yes. I'm just doing it. Right. Okay. We're going to talk to yeah, let's do it. Eric in KS, which may or may not be Kansas. Uh, and you want to steal Kansas. man the transphobe position? Is that right? Um, it's a bit of a weird question. Uh, I acknowledge. So I feel like maybe I should try and explain where it comes from. Okay. Um, I just stumbled on a YouTube video of one of these gender critical buttholes saying basically like, I don't get it. I don't get it. How do you, and, and they, their language was more crass than mine, but how do you have, let's say male genitals, but think you're a woman? I don't get it. And that, that really confused me because, um, I mean, uh, bless my poor to send her heart, I start at the same position they do, which is that I don't get it either. But then my next thought is, I don't get anybody's lived experience. I don't know what it's like yeah. to be Jewish in America and face anti-Semitism, or, you know, to be black in America or whatever, you know, I'm a cisgendered white guy. Um, my next thought then is, I don't need to get it to have compassion and to recognize that my trans homies are still people, and I should love and respect them. So how do you get from, I don't understand your view of the world or your experience to therefore it's somehow wrong. Like that's the part where my brain breaks and I just can't right. understand it. And this, this I, question should be like, I should be calling a transphobe show, but I don't want to give them the oxygen and you guys <laughs> deal with them day in and day out. So maybe you could explain like why they, how they get there. Sure. Yeah. I think that, um, there's, there's a few different motivations for people. Cause like often, you know, I've had, we've had people call into the show before and say like, I don't get it. Often we get like, oh, I get binary trans people, but I don't get non-binary trans people. And then I basically just say what you just said, which is I don't get it either. Like I don't get trans men. I don't get cis men. I don't, I don't get non-binary people, but I just am capable of empathy and, uh, I'm not an authoritarian prick. So I just kind of want them to if they're happiest life they can <clears throat> and it can be bewildering and infuriating to see people who like the worst is when they otherwise come across as normal and then they just talk about a certain minority as if they're just subhuman and it's just really jarring and weird but also these people are just kind of horrible to everyone it's just like why why is this important in your life and i think that there's a bunch of different motivations um, for a lot of people, <clears throat> and it's the same with hate, like you, this is general pattern you get with bigotry. They are brought up not interacting with a certain minority and also being told by society or their family or the people around them or whatever, films, Hollywood, anything that this, min this minority is like inferior to them or disgusting or should be feared or something. And then all of a sudden they're put in a position in their life where they have to interact with this minority or it becomes the topic that everyone's talking about or something. And suddenly everyone is saying things like, if you think this minority is disgusting, you're a bad person. And you're just suddenly like, everyone's telling you you're a bad person. And for a lot of people, I, I, this, I guess this is the, the mystery question. Like if someone said that about me, I wouldn't be like, <clears throat> Oh well, everyone else is wrong, and I'm going to find this little weird cult of on people online who also hate them, and I'm going to triple down and make hate them my entire personality. I would feel terrible and go home and think about it. But some people don't do that, and um, I mean that that is stuff I've done in the past. In fact, I've done it about trans people. I used to think trans people were disgusting, um, and that's one of the reasons why I never came out earlier. And when I went away and thought about it, because I was suddenly confronted with how my position was irrational and, and bigoted, it took me a few months and I got through it. <clears throat> um, 
but that isn't always the motivation of people. That that is some. That's kind of like the generic one, and usually you see this kind of mild entrenching where they want to make a joke that trans people are disgusting, like oh she has a dick, <laughs> and then no one laughs, or someone tells them they're a bigot, and then they get defensive, and they kind of burrow down a little bit, and they're like, no, you're wrong, I'm not wrong. And and then they go online and they write something transphobic, or whatever. That that's like a base position, but you get these people who kind of go totally off the rails. And because those those people, I've I've encountered plenty of those people in my life. And usually, if you just go up to them and be like, "It's all right, mate. Everyone's wrong sometimes. I'm not judging you as a person. I'm just saying what you're saying is garbage. Like, I'm a human too. Let's talk." Often they're like, oh, sorry, I didn't really mean to upset anyone. I just, you just think it's a bit weird, you know? And I'm like, okay, I think you're a bit weird. Let's just, you know, and we get through it. But there are a lot of people who just do not do that. And I don't know all of their motivations, but some of them do have, like, often there are motivations. There are deeper motivations. There's a bunch of different classes of them, and you can often with a lot of probing, work out who they are, in, for, for some cases. For example, you often find that particularly gender-critical men, um, their motivation is either that they have a trans kid, and they are it's often a child who's supported by their ex-wife, that is definitely a quite a common pattern, um, or they have like a trans relative, and they're angry about it because their kid isn't growing up how they want them to, and they feel like they own this kid's future, and they're they're upset and they're annoyed, and they don't know how to deal with it, and they can't face the reality of it. And another one is that they are hopelessly addicted to trans porn, and they feel really bad about it, uh, and they that makes them really angry. And that is also like, I don't want to. It almost seems like. Um, like a, a throwaway comment, like, oh, you're just angry because you're attracted to us. But it is amazing how common that pattern is, not just for trans people, but like for all um, bigotry, there is, for every type of bigotry, there is some link between at least, it seems, uh, men particularly, but probably women too, where there's some kind of sex thing wrapped up in it, where um, you often see that the most racist people watch the most, like interracial porn, the most, like, extremely homophobic people have some weird thing where maybe even though they are straight they have some weird attraction to gay porn in some way and the same with trans people like you see these studies where they're like the places that consume the most trans porn are the ones that vote republican and um so that that is a motivation too um and like i've encountered two with people it's been like there's there's one guy who kind of famously weirdo on twitter um who's like twin came out as trans and then feels super insecure at it as it because this is like your identical twin is now suddenly a, a woman makes people feel insecure in it like it's just the inability to um self-analyze and see that maybe you were wrong like some people just don't like ever being wrong and would rather burn all their bridges and and triple down than just stop and be rational um yeah that there's a, there's a bunch of motivations uh, another classic one is the closet trans woman or trans man who is virulently transphobic as like a defense mechanism to stop themselves from being admitting who they are and i don't want to give the impression that like it's a really tired trope that all of the homophobic like preachers and stuff they're all closet gay people some of them are but it's it's definitely not the majority and again here it's not the majority like the majority of transphobes are grim cis men who are straight absolutely aren't closet trans probably don't have a trans kid and just have some weird sex thing going on um yeah i don't know ben what do you think how who have you encountered what <laughs> yeah religion's um, another it, one obviously. it's kind of yeah, religion's a big one. It's it's definitely something that like there's a there's a lot of different reasons people have for like opposing trans people. And definitely I, I do hear the argument frequently of like, I just don't understand these people. In fact, like we had a call last week uh where Arden and I 
that are, were like, I mean, they, they, they were saying it out of curiosity and not trying to be mean, but they're saying like, I don't understand like trans people. And it's like, well, do you understand cis women? Do you understand all these other people? Like, why does this one group that you don't understand bother you and these other ones don't? Um, and there's definitely something like the media is doing a great job at highlighting this particular group of people for sure. Um, so it's on people's minds, like trans people are living rent free in a lot of people's brains now, which is kind of hilarious, but also really pathetic at the same time. Um, but it seems like there's a, a lot of just in general, like implicit bias and, and now some very explicit bias that people have, but like they just feel icky about something that they don't understand. And so an, an attempt to feel better about the icky feeling, like people want to feel like they're correct in feeling icky about it. And so they're like trying to rationalize it and be like, oh, why, why do I feel icky? Oh, there's this thing that I saw online of a person with a beard going into a women's bathroom that allows my icky feelings to feel legitimate. So I'm going to keep going with that. Um, and they'll find other ways to make their icky feelings feel legitimate. Uh, and then it just keeps going and going um, to where they now equate their icky feelings with logic and with um, real world things, which there really aren't necessarily those connections there. It's just the connections that person made in an attempt to feel better about their icky feeling. Um, and of course, that's just one hypothesis of of how this happens for people like others of course are with religion where your religion tells you that to feel icky about these people and so you do and this is actually something like i've noticed within my own life that i'm sure many people here do as well who have deconverted from religion like i used to feel very icky like viscerally icky about gay people specifically like i and i didn't know why i didn't know why i felt so icky about that. Um, but as I got to know more people and got to understand, wow, my icky feeling isn't rooted in anything logical. It's just rooted in an, like an irrational icky feeling. I was able to get rid of that and be like, I actually don't need to feel icky about this thing. Um, and, and I think some of us that are honest with ourselves can like combat that by you know, honestly changing our views once we learn that our icky feelings are, aren't rational. But a lot of people like refuse, <laughs> refuse to change their views and they just double down on it, even though the dissonance is there. Like a lot of people will know that there's a disconnect and they know that their feelings are not rational. But in an attempt to preserve their self image or an attempt to like not feel like they were being irrational, because I don't think anybody wants to feel like they were irrational. Like it's not comfortable to be proven wrong by any like for anything, um, but I think a lot of us on on our side, uh, at least many people who identify as skeptics will say, "Yeah, I was irrational. I'm embarrassed for how irrational I was, but I changed my belief." But that's a very hard thing to do, and people don't people don't want to feel icky. Like you get that same icky feeling when you learn I was incorrect about something. I have to change my opinion, um, and so I think those are a couple reasons why people go down this and and then you just end up too far and you're like, well, I'm going to risk my reputation to, to change my views, um, et cetera. And, and I think like, I don't want to straw man anybody's position because uh, I'm sure there, there are people who have reasons that are outside of what I just mentioned, but those are just some, some things that I can think of, of, of why people would be so persistent in this. Oh, yeah, wow. I, think, um... uh, I really like, oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So, sorry, Eric, I just was to add to what Ben was saying. I think that it's like a general pattern of humans to when they're faced with something they don't get to be frustrated with it and to like look around for validation that they're right to not get it. Like you see of people with maths, like when people don't get maths, they're like, maths is stupid. And they like look around the room and everyone's like, yeah, maths is stupid. And you're like, yeah, maths is stupid. I don't have to understand maths. Maths is stupid. And everyone's just like, yeah. And then they just kind of walk off thinking that they're right to do that. Uh, and that's like the easy way out. And people do that with everything. Um, and this is an example where they do it. And then the pushback is harder and people entrench. Like, I think it's something that I learned growing up to some degree. My reaction is to do that to everything when, I do, when I'm not good at it. It's to be like, 
this is dumb. I don't like it. Uh, and then I've realized I'm doing it and I'm like, no, that is a stupid reaction. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Eric, go on. Oh yeah. I was just going to thank you for your answer. There was, um, you know, some stuff that I was expected, suspecting may be involved, but also your answers contained a lot more, um, self-reflection and introspection of from both of you personally about yourselves than I was expecting. And I'm, I'm grateful that you shared that with me. Can, can I share with you one of maybe my uh, bumbling attempts to try and steal man the position? <laughs> yeah, you go for it. <laughs> um, Bumble away. <laughs> so like it, it, it hit me when I heard, um, uh, a female relative talking about voting for someone just because she was a woman in politics and and um it, but it was decades ago and and i watched how like women had a hard time getting into politics there were a few women in politics so they would close ranks because it's like a community under fire and it's taken until like almost now in the u.s where women can openly disagree with each other on the senate floor as opposed to like having the band together and and um you know, I heard this comment about like, yeah, she's a woman in politics, but I hate her politics. It's finally, and it's like, my thought process was when a community is marginalized, you have to close ranks no matter what. And then mm. some crappy people, um, because every community has crappy people, will sneak in. And that's sort of like, I, I sort of feel like that now with, let's say, um, non binary people. I feel like I have to be supportive of people who, I may not know or even like, but they're just, I have to be friends with them because they're non-binary and I'm ready for some day of enemy. Um, I'm ready for the community to progress to a point where you don't have to close ranks with everybody just because they're in the community. You, you, you can have those differences, but I guess my thought process was like, what if there are some crap people within a community and that they're getting a free pass just because the group is marginalized. I don't know if that yeah, makes any sense. I, th I think that, that, I mean, that happens to some extent because um, you see, like, I see every single one of my, tra literally all of them, 100% of my trans friends being accused of being everything under the sun. You know, all of the disgusting things they always say about LGBT people, pedophiles, rapists, misogynists, like, angry, narcissistic, stupid, arrogant, like, all of these contradictory things. So you get so used to just dismissing all of those um, ridiculous things all the time that, and, and it's not just like random accusations from nobodies. It's like the British news will publish some crazy story about how, you know, any, anything, they'll just make these ridiculous accusations. And then you read into it and you're like, Oh, this is a load of rubbish. This is literally just made up wholesale. And then once you've done that a hundred times, when something comes up, you're so ready to just be like, oh, the news always makes something up that maybe someone gets some level of shielding from that. But I'd, like you say, that's that's certainly not unique to trans people or or anything. It's that kind of a a result. I mean, it's like the boy who cried wolf, really. If they accuse every single trans person of being like a rapist, then if there's a trans person who's a rapist, everyone will be less likely to believe them. So um, like that's entirely on the transphobes doing that. Uh, and, and obviously, as, as soon as people do any actual kind of analysis and actually read into it, then people, will, you know, see what the reality is. I don't, I don't think like the idea that communities close ranks and protect really grim people, like minority communities. I just don't think that's um, on a large scale something that well, it doesn't happen in a trans community. Um, if anything, I think the trans community is incredibly quick to shoot people down and cut ties. And I think that the idea of I'm not going to like, I'll vote for her because she's a woman, even though she has bad politics. <laughs> that would not happen with a trans person in the UK. <laughs> like, I think if there was a left wing trans person and they were running for a left wing position, half the left wing trans people I know would be like, I fucking hate this person. I'll never vote for them. So I think we need to close ranks more, to be honest, if anything. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I guess it's one of those things that's that's kind of a concern, but the problem is caused by uh, the bigotry. And I don't think it has any major issues other than that people are 
less ready to take someone's word straight away. Um, it's not like people get protection for years or whatever for doing horrific things. Not in the same way like the church protects paedophile priests or um, cis male celebrities seem to rally around each other as soon as they're accused of sexual assault. You know, we don't have any power to to do those things. Um, and we're not invested in maintaining power we have because we don't have any. So it's not quite the same. But yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting idea for sure. But right, thanks, Eric. Thank I think it was a really good discussion, but we're probably going to have to move on now. So thanks for calling. And uh, hopefully we'll hear from you again in the future. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Thanks, Eric. Bye. Just also like to note that Eric's call notes match up from the two weeks that he's called in. <laughs> Eric was Eric last time he called in. Um, not sus not suspicious at all. Um, <laughs> so let's move on to our next caller. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's talk to yes. Jonathan in Ohio. We're having a bunch of Americans today. Who wants to talk about how do you know if someone's trans? Is that right, Jonathan? Are you there? Can you hear us? Are you still on the line? I know you've been waiting an hour. I'm very sorry. No problem. Jonathan, Hello, can you hear me? Oh, you're here. Hello. Hello, I'm Jonathan. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not unmuted. You're on the Hello. line. It's okay. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. What did you want to talk about? Okay. Um, yes, my question is a slight callback. Um, so there was a gender critical individual named Andrew, and his question was, oh, what is a woman? Um, I think sometime right. in that really heated discussion, there was a question about, he asked like, um, oh, how do you know if you're trans? That might be a, a para an unfair paraphrasing, but um, I think the response was, and I apologize if I misremember the response, but I think it was, to me, it was interpreted as like, that's a really rude question to ask, to ask someone, how do you know if you're trans or not? Um, and I think I understand that in terms of like, oh, you're not a real trans person, you know, you have to prove it to me. Um, but I think my question is more, I want to try to set it up as more like a genuine, you know, I'm someone who is unsure about the situation. Um, a lot of the definitions are very, um, very dependent on the person. So this is more like, how do you know you're trans, but not in like the political sense, it's more like, you know, I'm living my life. Um, I've had the thoughts come across my mind before I knew what trans people were like, oh, it'd be cool if I was a girl, you know, but I actually don't know mm -hmm. like what the past fail criteria would be um, to do that. And I think some of the questioning has to do with like, oh, we have to prove it to other people, but I don't know. So part of the question is, how do you know you're trans at an individual level? Not like, a, oh, I'm going to mm. force you to prove that to me or not. But in terms of like, I guess, how do you realize that, et cetera? And then um, if that's a fair question to ask, you know, yeah, like, yeah. is that rude I to ask? No, I think yeah, um, I think that's a, definitely a legitimate question to ask, and and maybe you're over worrying about it because when you're talking to a transphobe, and they're like, "How do we even know who even is trans?" That's why we've got to ban all trans women from the toilets. Like, that's a very different question to someone being like, "Uh, I'm worrying about my own identity, and I, I'm just worrying, wondering how you knew you were trans." Like, these are so night and day apart yeah. that I couldn't even begin to confuse them. Um. So I think that the best way to find out, you know, if you're questioning yourself or anyone listening, is to ask trans people, how did you know? Because if you talk to a thousand trans people and they all basically tell you your life story, but, you know, they're like, I did this and then I did this and you're like, oh God, this is me exactly. And then you talk to like a thousand cis people and their story sounds nothing like yours, then maybe it's worth pursuing a going a bit further and asking some more questions because you know it, it is quite a personal thing and it is quite hard to work out and there isn't just this easy test you take you can't just you know do a pinprick of blood and run it through a machine and find out if you're trans or not um 
So that is the kind of question you need to be asking people. And yeah, don't don't worry. I think if you if you if you know some trans people in your life or you want to ask random people on Twitter or whatever, go onto Reddit or something and you say, Hey guys, I'm struggling with my identity. Can you please tell me how you found out that you were trans? How did you realize? How did you know? No one's going to be saying, this is such a rude question. Get the fuck off our forum. You're probably going to yeah. be like inundated with people telling you their life stories, being super keen to tell you everything about their life because people like talking about themselves. Um, yeah, I don't know what you think, Ben. Is that how you read it? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely read it differently. But I, I think some tips would be like, yeah, either framing the question with that you're kind of asking about like yourself or yeah, using different phrasing of, of like, um, w would you be willing to like tell me your experience um, with learning you were trans or like um, Things like what what was it like for you to learn that you were trans or like all that like framing it in that way yeah. as as in like you're coming across like from um a well intentioned place but also that like you're not looking for a, a debate and you're looking more for their experience and their story I think is gonna be received pretty well um, because I think when people read it as like this person's looking for a debate that's where people don't want to talk as much and and it's true that some people might not want to share their story and that's fine like some people have stories that that they had some trauma um at certain points and they don't want to go over that and so as long as you're kind of framing it as like hey like the, would you be okay like sharing with me your story of, of your transition and all that like some people like I, I think Katie's right that a lot of people would be very happy to share that story um, with you as long as it's in like the right place and the right time and the, the right setting because because like if you've just met the person it's like that's kind of weird like if you just met like if, if you're yeah. in the line if you're in the line yeah. at the grocery store and someone in front of you is like is visibly trans it's not a good time to be like hey you want to share your transition be like i don't know you please don't <laughs> but like but if you know them yeah yeah if, if oh katie i think you're muted again <laughs> but um i was saying even then they still might <laughs> even then they still might but but just like be be cautious and, and like maybe like the best people like if, if you want just random opinions the internet is a great place for that because people will show up but like, if you're talking to to IRL people, it's probably better that like you you plan out like the the right time and place, or like that it's people that you know well enough to where it's not just like a cold question. Um, <laughs> but everyone's a little bit different. I mean, Katie will talk about herself any any time, but <laughs> <laughs> all the time. I just want to talk about me. Um, but yeah, <laughs> okay, I mean. It's fine. <laughs> how I how I personally went about this was watching a bunch of I mean there are videos on YouTube saying how I knew I was trans or how I came out and what's it like and all this kind of stuff and I just watched hundreds of hours of those and then I asked some questions to trans people and they told me and I mean the short answer is that I realized that kind of all of the rules on what you should be and what you have to do and stuff are just a little rubbish. And so I just broke it up into pieces and I was like, well, the question of what do I want to be and do I want to transition everything or whatever was too big for me. So I was like, well, do I want to laser the hair off my face or not? Yes or no? And the answer was obviously yes, regardless of whether I'm a man or a woman or anything else. So I'm going to do that. And then when I did that, I was like, right. Do I want to do hormones? Like, well, and then, you know, I just did those kind of steps one at a time. And then this is where I ended up. So um, you don't always need to answer the big questions straight up. And I think that helped me get through it all. And I just explored as well. Like, maybe you can you can talk, to, you could like, you can talk to a thousand trans people and you'll still never be a certain. And all you can really do is be like, I'm going to tell one of my friends that I want to explore and I'm going to see what that is like um and and then you're like this was the worst thing i ever did please never tell anyone again and then that's it or maybe you're like okay this is cool i'm gonna tell someone else so pro tip
I don't know if that helps. <laughs> that does help. I think um, framing it as like, oh, there's no pen prick. There's no like easy way, you know, no. to tell. That doesn't make more sense. Um, I guess to kind of put it to a broader question, like, I know there's a lot of rhetoric about like, oh, you know, trans people exist. You're going to make the kids trans. Like that whole rhetoric thing doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I guess putting it in terms of like, oh, it's a journey. Like it sounds like it's a journey you go on. Um, I don't know if that'd be like a good way to describe it. Um, but I guess it is, yeah, what I'm worried it's, about is the quest. Yeah, it's it's just yeah, it's, it's it's just a process. And I think everybody goes through a similar process, whether they're cis or trans. It's just it's a quest, as Katie is saying, to be the most you you. And that's really all it is. And I think that trans people, when they're on this quest to find the most of them, them, they end up at transition because that's the most logical step for them to, to be the best them that they can be. And so it's, there isn't a magic answer, but it's just kind of figuring your, yourself out. And like cis people do that with themselves too, just in, di in different ways. Like maybe for them, it doesn't lead to transition, but they find other things that make them happy with their lives and happy with themselves. And that's, that's all we're doing here. You, you just take the journey to find out what will make me the best me. And I'm going to do those things. And then eventually you get enough confidence to say, you know what? My happiness is worth more than these bigots opinion. And I'm going to wear a dress today. And that's going to make me happy as, as me. And you'll get like, and that's why it's for some people, it's a, it's a really fast thing. And they're like, yeah, fuck it. I'm just going to do what I want today. And I don't care what happens to me. And there, there are plenty of people like that. And there are others that say, you know, like maybe I'll eventually get some place, but I, I don't know yet, but today I'm happy taking the step and wearing different nail colors than I normally would. And that's going to make me feel a step in, in the right direction for me. Um, and even like they might try it and they might say, you know, that wasn't the right thing for me. I'll try something else. And that's really fine. Like that's, that's all this comes down to. And that can, I hope that can be liberating for you in that you don't need to end up at any particular answer. It's just yeah. whatever makes you happy being you. And that's that's what you need to do. If you want. Interesting. Yeah. If you want, you also don't have so to. I guess like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's no like, yeah, so I guess like, I think about things in terms of black and white a lot of the times. So I guess yeah. this is one of those things where you put it in the bucket of there's no hard boundary. It's like a self-identity thing. But yeah. okay. I think because uh, like yeah, it's it's very easy to see everything in black and white, and people love doing that. But when you dig in yeah. on anything, <laughs> it almost nothing is. Um, and and unfortunately, True. it's it's way harder to approach things when you don't see them as black and white. But some people like to say, "Oh, it, like we have in this court talk with the caller earlier." I don't know if you're listening then, but you often meet these kind of like people who see when you're finished transition is like one state and before transition is the other and then it's just like this binary jump in the middle and it, like even if you were a hundred percent certain and you transitioned the fastest you possibly could and you had unlimited money there would still be like years of gray area um where you know you're in transition uh, and unfortunately, nothing to do with trans issues is binary. And that's kind of like one of the reasons why we cause yeah. such a problem, because society generally sees things in black and white. But certainly with your own yeah. position, compartmentalize everything and realize that everything's just a sliding scale is like step one. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Wow, okay. Um, that was very helpful. It Good. sounds like there's no answer. <laughs> or there's no one there's no one right answer. I no, but, there's no but one that, right yeah. answer. But let that be let that be freeing for you. Like don't it's it's very easy yeah. to look at that and be like, There's no hope for me, there's no Intimidate. answer. Yeah. But there's no there's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Think of it as as freedom. Like there's no rule book for how to be the best you other than like don't hurt other people and like don't don't mm. don't be a worse person because of it, but the rules like, garbage. there's no, 
Yeah, the rules are made up. Like, and I, I said this the last time I was on too, like the societal norms are made up. Mm. Like, and it can be very do, angering in a lot of ways, but, but yeah, Katie. They're, they're made up. You can't act as if they are non-existent though. And I guess right. the, f the first thing to do is to just realize that they're totally made up and ignore them and see where you would be in an ideal world. And then you would then have to weigh the pros and cons of reality against where you'd be in an ideal world. And that's like a different challenge, but realizing where you want to be is is the first thing and the best thing to do there is realize that all these rules are a load of garbage um and yeah, yeah, I, think, yeah. I guess i think that is helpful you, i guess there is a, um, a very large level of anxiety about yeah you know the, the view of what trans people are and the anxiety about being seen you know like that in terms of other people's yeah. eyes you know because i'm pretty is, like, that's real this is yeah, that's yeah. That's I, this was I, the I biggest under thing for me. Criticism pretty easily, you know. Yeah. I'm yeah. like this. This was the that. biggest thing for me. I like my my yeah. the thing that stopped me coming. Like I I got to the point where I realized all the rules are made up, and I want to do something about it. But I was I was absolutely terrified that I would lose my friends and my family, and that people would think I was a freak and all this kind of stuff. Um. And the only real way that I could cure that, like I talked to a bunch of trans people and you can find trans people who have lost everything and you can find trans people whose transition was just like totally smooth and with no hiccups at all and everyone in between. And you just don't know where you're going to be because it's a factor of what kind of person you are, where you live, what religion you are, what society you live in, how much money you have, all of these different things. But I, in the end, had to cure that by just doing stuff. And I... Did the easiest, most sensible and rational step first, which was to tell one of my closest friends who I most suspected to have a positive reaction and most be capable of keeping a secret uh, and told her and then saw where that went. And as I told more people and realized that most people are supportive and most people are actually nice people and at least the people I'm friends with generally are nice people, I realized mm. that everyone... I wasn't going to lose like basically anything. Um, and then when I started moving around society and realized most people don't give a fucking shit. Like we, we saw this stuff in the news. We saw this stuff in politics and 99% of people don't care about trans people in the slightest or maybe, maybe 95, but like when you're walking down the street, most people don't even look at you. And of those who look at you, most people don't care. And of those who care, most are nice. And that, Sure, that does mean you will encounter some dickheads sometimes, and sometimes that can be really bad for some people if they're really unlucky. But generally, I mean, like I, when I wasn't passing at all, I was still living a happier life than before I came out. Like I was going to music mm -hmm. festivals, I was going to the pub, I was going clubbing, I was working in a job, I was making new friends, I all kinds of stuff, and and I just felt even more free because all these rules and stuff that. I was holding myself to before that society made up. I didn't have any more. I didn't have a secret anymore. I didn't, there was just nothing. It was just, I was so freeing. Um, and it's not totally free because I did get some random abuse sometimes. And sometimes it made me feel bad for a bit but on the whole, it was just net positive And the support from my family and friends was, the, is actually the only thing that matters. Like, I, I don't know where you sit on this and I think it's quite a hard position to get to. For a lot of people, but I genuinely do not give a fuck at all. And when people say that, they usually do. But I do not care what some random shithead thinks at all, because I've got loads of friends and family, and they're the people I do care about. And if my friends are fat, like if I did something to upset my friends or family, I care a lot. And it's like what other people think of me mm -hmm. does matter a lot to me. But I've just realised that most mm -hmm. people's opinions are just garbage. Like, is it? I just how I get myself into that position. I just remember that, like. There are a bunch of people who don't think women should be allowed to drive. Uh, like that, that opinion to me mm. is so utterly worthless. Like that is literally the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Like it's so monumentally worthless to me that someone who said that I wouldn't trust them on anything. Like it's so painfully stupid. But there were like literally millions of people who think that. <laughs> so every time that like I drive a car or my mum drives a car, there are millions of people who think that that's bad. And like, pff, all right, fuck them. It's just stupid.
Like, that, I, I don't care about them at all. And that's also yeah. what I think about people who think the trans people shouldn't exist. Like, it's, it's much harder to get to because there aren't many people in my life who don't think women should drive, but there are people around me who don't think trans people should exist or interact with a lot. But, you know, their opinion is equally rational. So, um, yeah. Anyway, we're rounding off. Jonathan, I hope this yeah. has helped. Do you have any last question you'd like like part to this question or do you think that's a good starting point no that was very immensely helpful and thank you for walking me okay. through that um that's great and yeah oh yeah thank you so much um and thank you for the service you guys provide <laughs> this is like it's uh, right i like love hearing the show and all people that stuff, can, so. all right thank people you people so can much. help out by uh subscribing to our patreon or doing a super chat for five dollars or more yeah. but yeah thank you very much jonathan yeah. and we'll talk to you again <laughs> yeah. thank you bye thank you so much there used to be this um, uh website called like uh am i trans.com or something and you go and you type in am i trans.com and then the website was just a blank page that said yes <laughs> and it's like <laughs> the only people who are googling that question are trans people who want reassurance that they're trans. Oh, yeah. But I don't know if That's I'd awesome. seriously look that to anyone. <laughs> um, what were you going to say, Ben? So we have been going for like a, a couple hours. So we can hit the last two calls if, if like we make them quick. But we also have the super chats. And I'm yeah. uh, I want to go to bed at one going point. out with another trans guy this evening to go be trans in public. And uh, we're going to probably tour. make people we come <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go and yeah, yeah, start a fight or whatever men like to do, I don't know. Um <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay. Maybe we will or oh, both the callers have been on the line for an hour. I feel like they could easily both be long calls. Maybe we'll take one and we'll see if we'll fit the other one in. Is are you up for that? Yeah, we can try it. We we'll just let them know that you know if if it goes a bit longer, we might need to kind of table it and and have you call back. But I think if we write down the names of these people, like if they call in next week, we can try to take them near the beginning so that like if if that is if we're not able to get yeah. through them. But okay, so I think we're gonna talk to uh, first. We'll, we'll try and get the other caller in, but. First, we're going to talk to Kevin in Japan, uh, because I don't think we've had a caller from Japan before. Who wants to talk about confrontation, being confrontational versus having a nuanced, nuanced approach. Kevin, are you there? Is that me? Hello. Yes, it Hiya. is you. <laughs> That's you, yeah. <laughs> hey, what's Kevin. going on? Hey, uh, I don't know. I've been listening for the past... Uh, Two and a half hours, and you kind of ran the the, the gauntlet on uh, <laughs> feelings. <laughs> um, cool. What what what, what I really wanted to ask about was uh, uh well, I, I I live in Japan, and uh, what what I I want to culturally preface it with, I guess. Uh, like if if you were to tell me that uh, uh, I am a trans woman, I would be like, all right, all right that's fine. I uh, go on, and it wouldn't be anything about that. I don't care about you. It would be more like a, a that's fine. Go on about uh, what else do you have to offer? It, and that sounded awful, didn't it? I'm sorry. Anyway, okay. um, like you guys, uh, and I'm I'm not calling you out, man, but. Uh, Dr. Ben, you you uh -huh. guys uh, some sometimes get pretty confrontational with people. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, we do. Yeah, and and and, some and sometimes I picture you with your 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 foot on the dinner table, pointing at my older brother, and saying, <laughs> "Look, <laughs> man." <laughs> and uh, I I wondered how that approach works as opposed to. Uh, saying to my old brother, hey man, let's just be cool, and then going about your business. So here's the thing. Here's the thing with that. And I know there's a lot of people that want to have these just kind, cordial discussions with people. And like, there's a time and place for that. But I think it's really unfair to 
criticize when when people are more aggressive because here's the facts of the matter. Like there are certain issues where you can agree to disagree and we can have a, a just cordial discussion. Um, like if you like the color blue and I don't, it's like, that's fine. You can have your agreement to, to disagree. Like um, if, if, I mean, Katie might feel differently about this, but if, if you go into a, a pub with Katie and you say, you know, I don't really like metal. Um, it's a time, <laughs> you know, Katie might be very passionate about that, but like, it's a discussion where nobody's impacted by that discussion. Like it's, you're going to be okay. You might not be the best of friends, but you know what? Everyone's going to be okay. Here's the problem with, with the trans discourse and this. There are actual people being harmed. There are people um, receiving violent hate crimes. Um, there are people that are being denied healthcare and being denied basic human rights. There's people being kicked out of their homes. There's people all across the spectrum of very terrible things. And people are making decisions based on their opinions around this issue and people's opinions matter in terms of other people's livelihood so this is where i am more inclined to be aggressive about it because you know what if i'm faced with a person who oh no i could be embarrassed or i could be having tension with this person like yeah i'm risking that but would i rather <laughs> sit back and have a kind discussion with somebody who's then going to cause you know, a trans kid to be kicked out of their house or cause a trans kid to lose access to healthcare or cause trans people to not yeah. be allowed to have public services. Like this is what's at stake here. And so it's nice yeah. to think, oh, we could just have these calm discussions with people. But the problem is the people that we're having the discussions with, they're making decisions like that for people. So no, like it's, it's not a bad thing to be aggressive. There are times where we should be more aggressive and we aren't enough. And so I, I get that we want to be nice, but there's not always a time to be nice like that. There's some people who will change their minds with a kinder discussion, but most won't. Um, and unfortunately, like it calls for us to to be more aggressive and to to engage more intensely um, because this issue does matter. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with um, you. I, I, um... <laughs> Sorry, I, I think what I'd add as well is the context changes a lot because like if you're at the dinner table with your family and one of them's like, yeah. oh, I think this, you can much easier have a conversation than when you have someone who's like a, a member of a hate group who's calling in publicly on a show in front of thousands of people. Like they're very different contexts oh. and I, you yes, need to yes, consider I, your platform and your audience and what kind of person you're talking to and what is actually important. Like, so for example, on my Twitter where I have like hundred thousand followers or whatever, I get people saying horrific things all the time. And I know that the audience looking at this are a mix of trans people who need reassuring, uh, trans people who just need to see someone fighting back. Um, like cis people who don't understand what's going on. Uh, transphobes who just want to cause pain, um, you know, all, all of these different yeah. groups. And I know the best thing to do is not to go like tread on eggshells and bend over backwards to be nice to someone and spend weeks and weeks trying to convert them to understanding basic empathy, because I know that the success rate of that is very low. And it will just come across as me sucking up to like people only see little sound bites. They don't see months of conversation and it will just come across as me like legitimizing their garbage position. Cause that's what you have to do when someone is wrong and holds an immoral position. If you just tell them it's immoral, they'll be like, you're being so angry. You can say it as the most straight faced, unemotional <clears throat> way. You'd be like, Oh yeah, but your position is terrific. Isn't it? Like that's a really immoral position to hold. They will get offended and they'll accuse you of being angry. That happens all the time. So when you know that this is going to happen, the best thing you can really do is like calmly correct them, tell them they're wrong, and calmly if they keep them. drilling, yes. to just to just ramp it up. And if they're not going to listen, like I, I feel like I have a problem where I can't get angry at people in confrontations, and I just keep walking around in circles and pointing that, that they're wrong and stuff. And I think that, like, I wish I could be more like Ben and Arden, where the they realize there's a point where someone's just a dickhead and they say fuck off.
because like that is sometimes the best use of your time. Sometimes it's the best thing they need to hear. And often it's the best thing that people watching the show or reading Twitter or whatever need to see because they need to see that some of these things are unacceptable. Like there is a line where it becomes unacceptable. Um, and and I think that like sometimes I get people messaging me and being like, oh, you're so much nicer than the other hosts. And I'm like, fuck off. Like that's that's kind of what I feel like because I mean, what are you saying? I'm more of a pushover or like you were l less offended by me saying that you're immoral because I was smiling when I said it. Like your position is still fucking garbage, mate. Like you're still factually wrong. It's just that I was not able to look you in the eye and call you a prick like you are. Um, not you, Kevin, obviously, like someone in general. Um, and I think so, I was, yeah. I think I was asking more along the lines of in a, in a, in a, a, a personal relationship and not, uh, like across the dinner table and not on, on social media. Sure, but like but with, in, I mean, either, with Ben and yeah, with, with well, Ben and other way, situations. I mean, what do you know about their family? Like, sorry, Ben, well, I don't know about your family. Though. Well, and, and either and either and either way with this, like, I think people are very detached about what a lot of people are saying about trans people. Like, especially if you haven't been the recipient of it. Like, if imagine if you were sitting. Um, across the table from your brother or whoever, and they just casually throw out like wanting to eradicate an entire people group. Like if, if they just threw out some um, something like that, like I hope that the majority I've, of people would say, "Hey, fuck <laughs> off!" Like you should not say that. Like or somebody said that they think that like mm -hmm. slavery should should be like it used to be. Like. That's a time that you should say, no, fuck off. That is a garbage position. You should not think that. And I hope that people wouldn't sit back and be like, oh, tell me more about your reasoning for why slavery is a good thing. Like, no, that's not a position I want to entertain. Like, that's not a position that anybody should think is okay. Um, and so, no, I'm not going to go with you there. And, and this is often the same kind of position that a lot of transphobes are taking. Like, there are arguments out there for eradicating transgenderism. That is something that is being said. There are people saying, become part of the 41%, which is in reference to suicide rates. Like, these are the things that are actually being said. And I think a lot of times, cis people especially don't understand the gravity of the positions being taken by transphobes. Like, this isn't just a nice conversation of, oh, well, I just don't think trans people exist. I mean, like, yeah, that is a thing that they say, but the, the, the underlying argument is that they want to get rid of trans people and they have very strong opinions about how they want to do this. Like they want to deny people healthcare and make a scenario where it is so hostile for them to exist that like you are like, if you look at the stages of genocide, like we are like, we're on those charts, like for, for transphobia. So like maybe if people understand how severe this is, it's easier to see why we would be aggressive about it and why we'd be angry about it. Because I hope that a lot of people that are trying to say we should just be nice to our sibling across the table, I hope that if somebody says something anti-Semitic and like being a Holocaust denier, I hope people would be aggressive about that too. Um, and if not, maybe there's something you need to look at within yourself and your own arguments of, of why am I nice about these things? And I'm not, I'm not, like accusing anybody of anything, but it's something that we need to think about. Like, why do I want to take the the nice road with these positions? I I, I understand exactly what you're saying. We're we're, we're typically we're typically not a uh, confrontational people. <laughs> we prefer to to keep the sure. peace. But I understand why 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 you would uh, why. It it makes sense, man. I, I gotta say. Yeah, I like I, <laughs> I, I I'm I not a confrontational hoping, person I, in real I, life, so I get it. I I was hoping this would have come out better. I I I thought that I had something to bring to the table, but uh, I, yeah. No, you're right, mate. It's I, it's, it's I, okay. I think like I think yeah, it's a valuable discussion. Like, sorry if we've come across confrontationally, which is kind of ironic if we have. Um, but I guess. Well, it, you know, I, no, no, no. It's, maybe I, that's not what I, you intended. I think you letters spot on. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and I, I think, I think the hard thing here is, is a lot of people that aren't at the tip of the spear for this conversation. It's easy when you're not the target to say, "Hey, we should just all be nice to each other." But the problem is, like, when people bring up this argument, if that was the case, we wouldn't need to talk about it because they're not being nice to do in the it. first yeah. place. <laughs> right. And the problem is, like, when people from the outside of the community come in and and say things like that, it's it's kind of invalidating in our position. It can be seen as gaslighting in a way of like we're doing this to ourselves, like we're being aggressive, and so we're getting treated this way because of that. Like I want people to be cautious in in like presenting this kind of argument because you're talking to a group that has been mi minoritized and has been oppressed and continues to do so, and then saying, "Hey, man, you should be nicer about that." When we're in a position where we have to fight for our rights, um, and and so I just I just caution people in bringing up that point because like yeah, I would love to be in a world where I could calmly have a discussion with somebody and have their mind change and have them be nicer to me. But that we don't live in that world. We don't live in that world because if trans people were to calm down and just play nice at the table, like we would continue to get stomped on. We continue to get bulldozed. And that's the world we live in. And so we're responding to real world scenarios um, with hopes that we can mm -hmm. eventually get to a place where we're at that. So that's that's why we're engaging in this way, and and I think that we just need to take more caution, especially people who aren't in those groups, being careful about what we expect people in that group to how how we expect them to combat their oppression, because you, maybe you don't know the full extent of the of the mountain they're climbing or the the fight that they're fighting. It is fucking bleak. I, I think that, yeah. that there's definitely room for both. Um... Things like you don't want to be someone who mm. just flies off the handle at every single interaction. The reality is, if you're an oppressed minority, you do have to tread on eggshells. Like, because if you don't, you end up being on the news as the and crazy, you know, trans person, the crazy gay person, the crazy black person, or whatever. And and that's what the masses yes. want. They want yes. to be validated <laughs> in, in seeing that. But at the same time, if you're just I always, am, uh... yeah. If you're just always I'm like the pushover on. person, then nothing gets done and people just walk on you all the time. And I think it takes real courage to stand up like the, you know, this kind of keep the peace thing. Keeping a peace is a skill to an extent, but like at a certain point, it becomes problematic where like an example is in these kind of closed, uh, tight knit, religious, almost borderline cult communities that you get in a lot of places in the US where a woman is sexually assaulted or something and if she was to talk to anyone they'll be like don't don't rock the boat you've got to keep the peace like these men are in positions of power and we can't be like ruining their careers and and then they'll just get trodden on and when they speak up they get accused of being angry and vile and witches and crazy and untrustworthy and all these things and character assassination stuff but the reality is that when she speaks up yeah. there are all these other people all these other women who are in exactly the same position who are given the strength on seeing this like this really is a really courageous thing to do to be the first person to rock the boat um so it, it is difficult and she's always gonna she's always gonna look crazy to the people on the sidelines who have no idea what's going on because that is how everyone who's invested in maintaining the peace like people oppressors benefit from maintaining the peace and that's how they want anyone who opposes them to look so i think you need to always bear in mind that um yeah pe people are trying to sell the idea of the crazy trans person just like they're trying to sell the idea of the crazy black person or the crazy woman um and it's very easy to buy into that propaganda but yeah i guess yep. just to like bring it back to your brother it's fine to go well out. It's, it's fine to tread on eggshells with someone who you're close to because someone's got to hold their hand for it or they're going to be a dickhead for the rest of their lives. So don't feel bad about not being angry yeah. about it. But also, if they are saying transphobic stuff every single day and you're just smiling to keep the peace, like maybe someone else listening is trans and you're just there letting them be a dickhead. So. And also, and yeah. also, maybe with that, like it's okay for for you if that's the way that you want to approach it, like with your family, that's fine. But maybe don't be angry at people who are part of the minority group 
who are constantly fighting this every single day and saying, you're doing this wrong because you're not doing it in the way that I would when you're not even part of the group that's being targeted. So that's just something to really be cautious about. I'm, I'm understood. I, that, that makes a lot of sense to me, and I, I thank you for your time. I hope we, you don't feel like we've been telling you off, Kevin. It, it is a good question, and I think it's a good discussion. Um, it's obviously something that... I mean, I've had a bad week, uh, and it's obviously yeah. something quite emotionally charged. <laughs> and perhaps it is for Ben, too. The things are fucking yeah. bleak at the moment. No, like, I don't know if you've seen what's going yeah. on in the UK, but it's it's real bad times. Um, so I, it, it's a kick in the teeth, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, it, it, there, there's a, there's cultural issues going on here as well, but uh, and where, where uh, the confrontation is uh, frowned upon, even yeah. if uh, and, and, and somebody does something very small, but. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. No, I'm no, you're right. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. And that's, I, and that's fine for your situation. I just, it's just more of like the <laughs> caution of, of like, like that's, that's fine. It, like you're going to have know. to tailor your discussion for, for your cultural context, but and it's not, we it's not my aren't necessarily, judge. we aren't necessarily in the same boat. But um, I, I do think that, I understand that. Japan, Japan and the UK Particularly, both have a very "do not rock the boat, deal with what you're dealt" kind of attitude, I, and it's why they're so socially conservative, and it's why both countries are so garbage for trans rights. Like Japan's way worse than the UK, but um, America was founded by rocking the boat, so it, it, we don't yeah, have yeah, as yeah. many. Is that right? Well, Americans are uh, just Japan is the terrib- I, I want to hear more yeah, yeah. about. A- <laughs> <laughs> about I, more about what's um, wrong. You, you think uh, Japan is uh, worse on the uh, uh, trans issues than uh, the UK? Uh, I mean, definitely. In terms of laws, like yeah. Japan has a law where you're not allowed to transition at all, legally or medically, if you have a kid who's less than 21 years old. Like, you're just forbidden from doing it. Um, and, like, Japan oh, yes, doesn't that, have gay marriage. Yes, and that, that is the case. Japan has mandatory sterilization for trans people. And uh, like, Japan's got a load of real fucking garbage laws for trans people i'm not even sure if you can update your passport i maybe i I don't know this day in our i would say in our defense that our our laws are honestly speaking nobody cares but yeah the problem is nobody does care but if you're a trans person who's just trying to get by in life Mm -hmm. and then you turn up to a job interview and you look like a woman and then they ask for your id and it says m on it they'll be like oh yeah so nice to meet you oh unfortunately there was a better candidate and that will happen to you a hundred times in a row (laughs) and no one's ever you don't have access to medicine and you don't like you because it's not just about your public image. Like the the laws that are passed will prevent you from even getting access, like to your your medications to transition, which can be a huge deal mm-hmm. for a lot of people. So it's like these things impact more than just some of those societal interactions. And like Katie's saying, a lot of those interactions do impact your your outlook on life and impact your your job prospects impact your family life impact your ability to function in society so all of this matters yeah like if we if, got along really well up until this point but did you just teach me about japan well i mean you asked what we know about trans rights in japan and i was just listing off the laws that i know about japan i mean japan doesn't have good lgbt rights on paper for sure there will be like people aren't confrontation about it. Whenever I've been to Japan, both before and after passing as trans, and before and after changing my documents, never had any problems. Japan is an incredibly polite, very safe society, but the laws there are garbage for trans people. I mean, do you are you disagreeing, saying that I'm wrong about that? Is there something that you think I need to look up or? Well, I mean, thank you for teaching me about my culture. <laughs> I know about your culture. It's about it's the laws cult- written on the books laws. of your country, or, or, or uh, you know, whatever country. I mean, I'd, the UK has got absolutely garbage laws for trans people in some places too, but we don't have mandatory sterilization. That's something that all countries should get rid of. That some con- lots of countries have it. 
uh, I mean, we in the UK, in America, in lots of places, you're allowed to transition if you have a child. I mean, that's a that's a really grim law. In Russia, you're not allowed to drive if you're a trans person officially, or at least in some places. I mean, that's no I, comment I on Russian in, people. Russia. That's no Russian. There's no comment on Russian culture. That's mm. that's not me telling Russians about their life. Hey. That's just me saying. Your country has fucking garbage laws when it comes to trans mm. people. That's all. Can I, can I uh, read you something really cool? You can. It's not out of the fucking Bible or anything like that. Um, uh, one of my <laughs> favorite uh, authors is uh, is uh, Hunter Thompson. You guys, you guys must know him, right? I've heard the name. Hunter Tom, Hunter Thompson. No. He wrote a book uh, about uh, the uh, the Hell's Angels in the, the United States. I think it came out in like, like 67 or 68 or something like that. It's a really good uh -huh. book. But he was writing about the Hell's Angels. And I think this comment really describes a lot of the bullshit that uh, uh, people, people everywhere have to deal with. But it, it, here it is. It's just a single line. Some of the assholes understand this communication gap, but most are puzzled and insulted to hear that normal people consider them horrible. They agree, they agree when they read how filthy they are. Oh, wait, hold on. They get angry when they read about how filthy they are, but instead of shoplifting some deodorant, they strive to become even filthier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it certainly sounds like Graham Linehan. I don't... <laughs> you know. But yeah, um... Yeah, thanks, Kevin. It was a good discussion. We, Sorry if it was uh, <clears throat> unintentionally confrontational in some places, and uh, I hope you uh, maybe re listen back and see that we weren't making any comment on Japanese culture. Um, but yeah, good. it was a good we're call. Good and yeah, I know. I love Japan. It's a great place. Um, but yeah, uh, please I, do call I, in I really, again, and we'll have really you in the wanted future. To, I really wanted to call you guys and be nice. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. You were nice. It was a nice call. Um, sometimes people get off uh, on the wrong angle or whatever. But anyway, it was great. Um, we'll talk to you again in the future. Bye. Uh, interesting. Oh, I can't hear you, Ben. I don't know if you're muted or oh, if my sorry, sound's muted. Um, oh, sorry, muted. No, okay. I, I feel bad for, for the last caller because like, we just took so long and i can't stay super long and i because i know we have super chats yeah we're gonna um, i'm really sorry if um you want to call in next week if you're on the line right now we will have you as the first caller we'll write a note somewhere arden maybe you write that note i don't know who writes the note someone can write a note i would like to talk about it because they want to talk about all the bullshit that's just happened in the uk this week um and because that will get katie like for half the show anyway. so yeah, actually our yeah I'd, i don't know also... if I... I let our screener go because I thought we were going to take everyone. Okay. So, Mario, you should be able to hear us right now. I'm sorry we can't get to your call, but try calling back next week. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, because Kitty um, has been half yeah, a show right. on that topic. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I've, I'm really... It's pretty fucking bleak, to be honest. Um, if anyone is not paying any attention, just a quick TLDR is... Uh, the Conservative government commissioned a review of trans healthcare. Um, and they've decided to, that they're going to ignore all of the evidence and they're calling to like ban trans healthcare. It's pretty grim. It's pretty extreme. Um, I don't want to be alarmist. Like that's probably not going to happen. But both conservatives and the Labour are like, oh yeah, this sounds great. Like they've got this list of one hundred and something studies, and they've concluded that ninety eight percent of them are going to be ignored because. I'm not going to go off. They've just decided to ignore 98% of the evidence. And then they're like, so in conclusion, there's not enough evidence. Uh, so now we're going to recommend something for which there is literally no evidence um, instead. So, I mean, there's no evidence to support conversion therapy. There's no evidence to support denying trans people healthcare. But the whole thing just seems like it was corrupt and a sham from the start. I mean, to be honest, we already kind of knew that because they were working with conservative, they were working with conversion therapists and apparently even meeting ron DeSantis's team and stuff to discuss it so it just seems like a fucking scam from the start um but i'm sure we'll hear more about it next week and there'll be loads of uh i mean already people are pulling apart this report but let's move on to 
super chats and perhaps super i'll chat. go with the first one because it's from sean and it's probably maths so sorry to jump in first ben but five pounds for sean i proved a theorem of my own today nothing too fancy just that the value of a particular function is two for infinite groups excellent good stuff sean <laughs> nice nice for anyone who doesn't know sean's our resident maths nerd um and always comes out with a good slash brain melting super chats um over to you. Five dollars from Dan Johnson. Happy sixth birthday, Annalise. I don't know who Annalise is. I'm guessing this is somebody that you know, but I'm happy to give a shout out happy for birthday. Annalise's sixth birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. Five dollars from Melissa. The line store needs to sell a poster with Katie looking pleased, Ben looking horrified, and a caption that says, Everyone on my floor is coding. I don't quite get yeah, it. Yes, <laughs> that meme. Oh, it, there's a, there's a meme on the internet where it's like, it's got everyone on my floor is coding, and it's on the one hand it's computer scientist, and on the other side it's a doctor, and so the computer scientist is like, "Yay, everyone's coding," and the, the doctor's like, "No, everybody's coding." <laughs> <laughs> oh, because coding we means that'd be a good one. For us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, we can make that, I'm sure. This one's you, I think. Oh, is it me? No, Sorry, it me? I thought it was you. Is it? Oh, it might yeah, be. I just oh, no, it is me. One, You're right. 20 pounds. I'm just gaslighting you. 20 pounds from Jackie Greenland. I thought I might enjoy the high of securing uh, TS tickets and seeing the Eclipse in the same week for at least a little while, but no, I had to come back right to the cast garbage, which I'm sure will come up hashtag Team Katie. Hasn't come up. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, it hasn't come it. up. But, yep. Next next time. <laughs> Four ninety nine from Gayest Husky, the gayest one of all. Uh, <laughs> what's the difference between the Vatican and a bucket of shit? The bucket. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> Love it. To be honest, I'm sure the Vatican Love has beautiful it. architecture. Yeah, it's a, a it's beautiful architecture of off. shit. It's it's a very um. <laughs> GRS trans rights situation where they had to go through and saw the penises of all the statues. <laughs> but they actually did, by the way. Um, five pounds for uh, Sean Ishwood. Oh, wait. Is this you now? You throw me off. I think Who is, is it me. now? I think oh, it's okay, me, but it. it's Sean, so you can take it. Okay. Oversimplifying definitions <laughs> lead to misstating the analytic continuation of the zeta function and thinking the infinite sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 is minus 112 very bad okay so this is to do with oversimplifying definitions there is a proof to show that one plus two plus three etc equals minus 112 and presumably that's nonsense so um good stuff <laughs> thanks sean next nice nice good. uh five dollars from melissa just in case zeta is the greek letter zeta we already Thank know you. that one, Elisa. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Five pounds from Critical Cory. I can't imagine being constantly attacked just for existing. Sorry you have to deal with this. The world is better with you in it. Lots of love. Thanks, Cory. That is a very kind message. It is pretty exhausting. Um... Yeah, it's just scary when the governments get involved. $10 from Charlie Carrot. I appreciate the show so much. Thank you, Katie and Dr. Ben. Shout out to the producer and the mods as well. Yes, shout out to the producer and the mods. I'm not going to shout out Katie because she sucks, but everyone else is fine. <laughs> and the call screener. <laughs> and the call screener, yes. Um, nine ninety nine from Louise Richardson. Sounds like a Blair White type. There are trans women who think that if they suck up to trans criticals, they will be accepted. In the deaf camp, they will die too. <laughs> I mean, very to the point, but yes, it's true. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely a theme of oppressed groups sucking up to the oppressor for validation. It definitely happens. Um, anyway, I've got a video on that on my YouTube channel if you're interested. 
Oh, Bolt. $5 from Boltorian. I heard that Arden is producing today, so I'm here to humbly ask Arden to come play D&D with Ben and I. This I did I did pose the question to Arden. We'll, we'll come up with some dates, but yes. Um, yes. As we will play D&D. &D. After the April insanity that I'm living right now, yes, that is doable. <laughs> Maybe. Just kidding. <laughs> Thanks, Bolt. Uh, 50 Swedish Corona from Puck Tholander. As a non-binary, I don't want to pass as male or female, but I still need to pee. If someone is uncomfortable with that, that's their problem. Yeah, like, we can all come up with this hypothetical situation where there is a trans person who is also a sex pest, and just ignore the fact that 99% of sex pests are cis people who are going <laughs> to break the rules and wave their genitals around anyway. But like, most trans people, 99% plus, just want to kind of get on with their life and like maybe you staring at them makes them uncomfortable and you should just stop staring and just get some real problems. <laughs> Five pounds from Samantha Patrick. How does Summer feel about cis women who have full facial hair using women's spaces? That's a, I think that's a question we uh, we asked and yeah, I don't know. Thanks, Samantha. I think the answer is the exceptions don't count because that's usually the gender critical response. Twenty dollars from Larry Fishman to be sold on the ACA exchanges and get corporate tax benefits. American health insurance plans have to cover medically necessary gender affirming care, which includes FFS in most states. My consultation in in July. I didn't know that, and that's good news for you personally and for trans people in general um you certainly can't get it covered in the uk like absolutely no way oh also, apart from scotland this is just not completely true because the aca has to cover things that are medically necessary they don't just have to cover things that people tend to get and most insurance companies make an argument that ffs is not in fact medically necessary i did yeah, it depends on the insurance. I did actually look at Kaiser Permanente's statement because that's what Summer was um, saying she had. And they have criteria which can be used to demonstrate that FFS is, is necessary, but there's a there's a process. And like it includes the usual stuff to get gender affirming surgery, but then there's also steps that you have to like document which particular parts of the surgery, like which particular facial features are distressing you have to have like documented distress of those things and you have to like has to specify that you uh the changes are within like reasonable modification for the like identified gender and that it's not just like changing things purely for a cosmetic reason um it, which is like it's a lot of things that are very difficult to prove um, and so I can see why, like, there's a lot of debate on how insurances would cover that. But that's that's a statement from Kaiser Permanente that I saw. So they they have ways that you can do it, but it sounds like there's a lot of. It's very. It seems very difficult to be able to do. Also, I hate to backseat host, but I want to point out that Summer said she got it approved by WPATH, which is not a thing. Which doesn't make sense. WPATH doesn't approve <laughs> or deny anything. They just no. create guidelines for healthcare. Was was a yeah. little bit of sus. That's, uh, that's kind of why I spent a lot of time drilling down on the uh, yeah. the order yeah. of things. Yeah. Not calling uh, you out necessarily, ten... Summer, but there were some red flags. I am. She's alive. Yeah. Ten dollars from <laughs> name. Yeah. Ten dollars from SJL. I I say as I say it as I don't emotionally understand being trans. I try very hard to understand it intellectually. I've never doubted my gender, but I do have empathy, and not everyone has the same experiences. Yep, pretty much. That's fair. Ten pounds from Helen Lawson. We live in a world that now regards hatred and fear as a legitimate business opportunity. That needs to change. Yes, it does. And no, it never will. Optimism. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Nine ninety nine from Heather P Geek. Heather R P Geek. There we go. I see it. As a transparent, I want to thank you for all you're doing for the show. 
You all have educated me not only about trans issues, but also what it's like to be trans. Deeply appreciate you all. Heart, thank you for your first super chat. Um, thank you for joining us here. Uh, very excited to have you around. Thanks for checking out the Patreon. <laughs> 999 from Alice Rosas. Jonathan's call got me emotional. It's been about a year for me and I've had no progress. So transition still feels like something for others and not for me. So hearing about the realization period took me back. Yeah, I'm sorry that you feel stuck, but maybe this is the kick up the bum that you need to um, re reanalyze your situation. Uh, but sorry if you're trapped in a situation where you can't. Yep. Uh, Five dollars from Jonathan. Thanks for taking my call. Feel lucky I got to talk to both of you. Heart. Thanks for calling. You don't need to feel yeah. lucky that you talk to us because we're not special. <laughs> we're just you people that say things. On the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a good call. Thanks. Five pounds from Samantha Patrick. Hashtag Team Katie and Poppy. Get wrecked, Ben. It's the first one. <laughs> well, see, actually, there was another Team Katie earlier, but it's funny because, like, now they actually have to specify because they can't just rely on, like, Team Cat because all three of us have cats. So, <laughs> four ninety nine from Ben us, Nine you know our cat's names. Great show, thumb heart. My Great cat's sleeping over, over there. Yeah. Yay. Oh, um, so thanks everyone for watching the show. I think that was our last super chat, which is good because it is bedtime for me. Um, I we had a, we had some argumentative calls this week. I hope it was exciting. Uh, I hope you're holding up with all of the garbage news that just seems to be relentless. Just remember, this year is an election year, and the strategy of going all in on transphobia for politics cannot last forever. Unless, of course, it wins them this election, in which case we are truly fucked. But I can't see the right wing in the UK or the US winning on transphobia. I don't see the right wing winning at all in the UK. Good luck, Americans. And the rest of the world, I don't know, we've just got to... We're still just riding it out. It's always gonna it's always gonna get bleak. It's still gonna get worse, but we're gonna get through it and it is gonna get better. So just keep uh keep focusing on the top of the mountain and um focus on yourself and make sure you personally survive this because the number one fuck you to transphobes is that in ten years you're at the other side and they wasted their lives. Um so we got this. Keep going. Ben, do you have any final thoughts? <laughs> um, that's it <laughs> yeah that's it i was gonna say something witty um but you know i'm just the the world the world sucks the rules are made up um i'm gonna go do trans things with my trans friends and make everybody uncomfortable that's it and then you're gonna come home <laughs> and you're gonna read about fucking medieval archaeology or something uh, until oh, 4 a.m. Yeah, I'm gonna do probably. that too. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Anyway, probably. Thanks You're for right. watching, everyone. Good luck. Um, check out our Patreon because this video will de be demonetized because we said the word sit in Elon Musk. Also, thank, thank you, you Xenoian and Monkey, a typewriter for those two main super chats. We see them. Sorry to get to them. We love them. We love them. We love them. Fuck Elon Musk. <laughs>